<sighs> Welcome to Blink-155, the only Blink-182 podcast that is also a Skate Kitchen fan podcast. Josiah, how did you enjoy the film Skate Kitchen? I love the film Skate Kitchen. It's so good. I saw it at Sick, Sundance man. in January. Since yeah. January, I've just known what's going to be the good movies, and I've just been quietly sitting here with my fingers clasped. And every time someone says a movie's good, I just do a gentle nod and go, I know. <laughs> I know it is. You're so I've known wise. that for months. You're I've known so that for wise. Months, you charlatan. <laughs> <laughs> What's gonna be the hit movie of the fall, Josiah? Um actually all the all the good ones I saw at Sundance this year are, are now out. So I think that's about it. Oh, how convenient um, that now you're positioning yourself as this sort of all seeing. Well, movie I gotta go oracle. to TIFF now and find out what'll be the good ones of the fall. Right. Well, it's so interesting that you mentioned uh, you needing to go to TIFF because, of course, when you're in Toronto <laughs> for the Toronto International Film Festival, we will be having the first ever Blink 155 live event. Of course, I'm talking about Blink 150 Live plus Adam's <laughs> songs. Right. Hard to know how Great to sort title. of market. Really punchy title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, in the, in the spirit of the podcast, it's um, completely impenetrable to anyone who hasn't listened to all 60 <laughs> episodes, 59 episodes. Uh, I think it's course, like, uh, yeah, I, w- I was working yesterday for hours on uh, something for the show, of which I will not reveal yet, but um, I showed Wife of the Pod Sarah what it was, and she said something along the lines of like, it made me feel really depressed, and it made me feel really sad that I have to be alive at the same time as this. And also, it's really great. Good work. So <laughs> that really summarizes what you can look forward to at the show. Yeah, so if that sounds like, you know, a hell that you want to uh, immerse yourself in, uh, my reaction to what you have created was simply, holy fuck, dude, you have truly outdone yourself. So, <laughs> right. And, this is and only- it was about three times longer than you thought it would be. So <laughs> Right, yeah. Um, this is I have not completed what you have sent me so if you if you want to you know see what uh you know uh, sarah has called uh horrifying and i have called holy fuck um (laughs) september 9th at the monarch tavern in toronto uh we will be debuting this along with i think it's going to be a pretty a pretty sick show a lot of multimedia elements a lot of uh like cirque du soleil style um (laughs) yeah whatever they do it's. Uh, I think they're on roller skates a lot, and, um, <laughs> and then there's a lot of like. I went to it one time touching. actually because I got free tickets to like a shitty Calgary one. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was one of the touring ones, but it was like, it looked like a Bug's Life, but then someone was also doing like a ripping guitar solo <laughs> while they were floating, dressed like they're from a Bug's Life or like um, Thumbelina or something. It was horrible, right. truly <laughs> awful. I kept wishing that all the ropes would break. You wanted to witness some sort of uh, Robin-style superhero <laughs> origin story? Yeah. Uh, but speaking of th- actually nothing to do with any of this, another thing we should talk about very quickly yes. um, is we should give a little... This might have to be a semi-regular thing because of our ongoing relationship with them, um, but a little Smash Mouth update, I think, because last week we were talking about Smash Mouth That's and how they right. refused to come on the pod. <laughs> Um, so, and then in case you've missed it, I like, I'm obsessed with Billy Corgan. It's fully Billy Corgan season right now, as are you, right? You went to the show. I went to the show. I could not believe how good the Smashing Pumpkins were in the year of our Lord, 2018. It was three hours of just nonstop ripping solos and big nineties tunes. And I was delighted consistently. He is a true musical genius, regardless of what you think about all the other stuff. Yes. Um, but one thing I love about him right now is that he's kind of like having this ego death moment online, which I can really relate to, just like <laughs> losing yourself yeah. in the web. Um, but yeah, he always goes on his Instagram stories and does that thing where you can answer questions from people. And so I was looking at it specifically to see if he would mention Blink-182 at all. And he did. And I put it on our Instagram. He did actually give me what I was looking for. He said that he thinks Tom DeLonge is doing really good work by researching aliens. So um, that's really important. That's sort of like the lost fact of this otherwise (laughs) absurd story. Right. Yeah. For some reason, that I think very important fact wasn't picked up by international music media like it should have been. And it, <laughs> I think had this second thing not happened, maybe the effect of the first thing would have been greater. But you're right. It's it's sort of like uh, who who died the day Michael Jackson died? You know, it's like that. The person that oh, yeah. we, we literally can't uh, remember. Music. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> just like very, very earnest <laughs> joke. Like not even a joke, just an earnest statement. Yeah. That's my new vibe True. that I'm going to try to do. Well, um, get ready for yeah, this so one. <laughs> in addition to, uh, t- uh, I don't even know what that's called, Instagram question answering about how Tom DeLong kicks ass, which mm-hmm. he does. Um, Billy Corgan also, someone asked him, like, this just came out of nowhere. Someone was like, have you ever seen Shrek? Which is just kind of like, at this point, an eye-rolling internet question. Like, oh, Shrek, whatever. But then <laughs> instead of just saying, yeah, he said, we were originally offered Shrek before Smash, or before Smash Mouth. And then they rescinded their offer and gave it to Smash Mouth instead. Like, what a weirdly aggressive throwing down of the gauntlet. <laughs> Just about coming something in that Smash is n- Mouth. <laughs> like, why is the Smash Mouth OST so important to everyone? <laughs> it's so weird. Like, you have all these other accomplishments. Everyone is celebrating Smash Your this year. And you're like, yeah, well, we could have had that goddamn Shrek soundtrack. Well, there were a lot of jokes about the tour originally not selling well. Now, the Toronto show was super well like attended. It was, it was you know full right up to the rafters. But I think it was like Pitchfork had the headline that was like "Empty List is Loneliness and Loneliness is Whatever Cleanliness and uh, Emptiness, Emptiness and uh, That's Empty," just like the Smashing Pumpkins reunion tour, right? Oh God. So mean. I know. Those music journalists. Have some respect. I mean, I like like I've said before, I've had my recent Billy Billy Wakening where I've listened to all of the like the pre quote unquote reunion albums and there's some really good stuff in there. Are you getting into his poetry too? Um I wish. <laughs> we used to have his poetry book actually. Blinking um, with fists. Ooh, blink. Good little oh, uh, tie in. Wow. We used to have it but it was and it was signed by Billy, but it was uh good thing to put on ebay so we did that instead <laughs> nice how much you make um, for it i can't remember but anyways the point is he threw down the gauntlet and said all this shit about the shrek soundtrack and then i turned that into an exclaimed news story and because i am in like speaking terms with smash mouth on twitter <laughs> we follow each other we dm i sent it to them and it was like thoughts and then they said all this shit about how billy Billy Corgan's ego was out of hand and like they probably asked tons of musicians and they also asked eels and I don't know. They said all this shit that like started a, a cold war, if you will. Um, I like that they everywhere. dragged eels into it. <laughs> I know. And eels never replied <sighs> probably for the better. I don't like, I don't really like eels. No, I wasn't, I wasn't going to put up with eels yakking at me and, <laughs> In the in my noties, um, <laughs> right? But then, like, I don't know. Maybe there's an opportunity to get the guy from the Eels on the pod, and like, that's interesting. So, uh, but either way, it's fine. Either well, yeah. Speak. I mean, speaking of that, so this blew up. It was everywhere. Like people on like uh, alternative rock radio were were reading my tweets again. I'm pretty much like w- w- through the pod as well. Like we are defining the. Uh, half hour news updates on alternative rock radio yeah we should be getting residuals for sure (laughs) for the most pathetic medium in the world yeah um (laughs) if you're doing a morning show and you gotta do a news hit between like yucking it up about the local sports team and traffic and then or like i love when they do on the radio like have you ever had to like buy something unmentionable for your girlfriend it's disgusting. I'm so embarrassed, dude. <laughs> like stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely like I think a, a sort of daily a topic of conversation on most most morning shows is <laughs> having to buy intimates. Um, so so together, sort of holding hands with each other, me and Smash Mouth made history again this and, week. And, and you so I were thought, in, I, but I think this is important because the way that you teed up the tweet by sort of presenting the, the Billy Corgan statement, asking their thoughts, their answer only makes sense in the context of your tweet. And so your tweet was embedded in every news story about this. So I saw it on Vulture. It was on Pitchfork. I mean, it was literally, it was in Vanity Fair. <laughs> yeah. So it literally was, it's so funny. I know. Um, it's kind of true. And yet, ironically, like, we didn't get... I don't even think that was our top story that day. Really? It's just... I mean, because I guess everything you need is right there in the tweet. Yeah. And, I don't know. And it's so bizarre. <laughs> it's probably the sort of story that is extremely of interest to the kinds of people that write music news. But... Maybe when you get into like a younger demographic that spends most of their time on the internet, Smash Mouth and Smashing Pumpkins are not two names that you're gonna like smash the link button on. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's too it's too perfect. Like there's there's basically two things that 
will get hits. I, I would say three, actually. Mm-hmm. There's the rule of Grohl's. Anytime Dave Grohl does anything, if he takes a shit and he posts about it, turn that into a news story because all the dumbass, like, 40-year-old um, nerds who love rock music will click that. And then if something happens involving Smash Mouth and Shrek, you should probably still do it. Even though it's, like, so corny at this point, it'll get tons of hits. And then the third thing is obviously if somebody is accused of sexual assault. <laughs> so those are the three. So with this, you had one, and then you kind of supercharged it by adding Billy Corgan, who people have really been, I think, loving his return to the spotlight. Exactly. Um, but yeah, and then Billy Corgan didn't respond, but I did see that he wrote he wasn't going to be talking about other people's bands anymore <laughs> on Instagram. He did write that, so he kind of uh, bowed out. But I thought, me and Smash Mouth have made history together once again, so maybe I'll try <laughs> one more time to ask them to come on the pod. And they said no. I don't get it. Like, what are they worried about? I think what it is is that, like, because... It's not one guy running the account. It's like clearly Steve, the singer, gets on and says some extremely spicy shit and starts <laughs> fights all the time. And yeah. then someone else will come in and sort of like, because there was a reply like three days later, like, oh, we still love Billy and think he's a legend. It's like, I don't think that's Steve anymore. <laughs> I think right. Steve gets like, <laughs> Steve gets a few too many margs in him and then starts like <laughs> getting salty on the timeline. Um, <laughs> I mean, what a gift. So I feel like they're afraid that if they go on the podcast, they'll be too unfiltered and just, like, fire shots at everyone, which is also exactly why I want them on the podcast. Yeah, well, you know, the podcast is still young. There's still time. We've got a lot of episodes to wear Smash Mouth uh, down with. But I I, I am curious, Josiah, for you, because periodically in, in my professional life, and I'm sure you've had the same experience, you're, like, in a scenario where you can't help but think, holy shit, if I could tell... 13 year old me that you'd be doing X or Y meeting so and so like you 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 wouldn't even believe it. And that's <laughs> as part of sort of being, you know, like music entertainment journalist, th- that's kind of becomes this recurring uh, g- gift that goes along with the sort of lack of payment, I guess. But for you to have started a beef between <laughs> Smash Mouth and Smash Mouth, it's like you engineered a beef between Cherub Rock and Walking on the Sun. You know, it's one of those things where, like, I realized how much I take it for granted because I was – the whole day I was like, oh, this is just a normal day. And then I had friends, like – friends I hadn't spoken to in forever <laughs> sending me text messages like, so is this actually your job to do this or <laughs> – <laughs> Did any of them say that it was kind of pathetic? There are so many times in that conversation that the word pathetic should have been dropped. Yeah, sorry. I, I wanted to keep talking about it. No, no. I mean, like, the whole situation was so pathetic. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, I feel like now's the time, but I kind of want to get to the end of this. As soon as I say at the start, like, oh, we're recording, you could say that's pathetic. <laughs> like, the whole, the entire process from start to end. Uh, I, I, so we were talking about this before. We started recording and and probably should have stopped right away. This episode, especially on the heels of last week's episode, where I said one sort of mock earnest thing and there's already a fake Twitter account dedicated to it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I still don't know. Like, and I, I get frustrated when people say to me, like, I can't tell if you're being ironic or not when I'm being sincere about liking something. Right. And I feel like the opposite problem is happening to you where <laughs> I don't know if you actually were joking or not. I was joking. Mac and cheese of the heart. Thing. I, I was, don't know, it like, was like, a, that's not a sincere, <laughs> like I wouldn't, I, I, I understand that I have been, I've made the mistake of being sincere in the past. And so that perhaps colors <laughs> uh, people's opinions of the things that I say. And I wasn't being like, I wasn't doing a voice like I wasn't it wasn't a character of like sincere man. It was an exaggeration <laughs> of a point that I was trying but, to make. But like what <laughs> I don't get what the exaggeration was. I guess because if you were being sincere you would have chosen a different dish other than mac and cheese. <laughs> right. I mean <laughs> like a, like, I do like really you like said mac a and sandwich cheese. of the heart. Yeah. <laughs> Like just uh, you or know, pizza a, of the heart. The pizza of the punk. heart. Yeah. So look at the point is that I don't really want to talk about this anymore. I, I I dipped into 
in my mind, a little bit of a satire of my own earnest nature, <laughs> just a bit of subtle, clever tomfoolery uh, for which the less intelligent uh, people on this podcast, uh, you know, have now just decided to rake me over the coals for a week. <laughs> so this... I thought it was nice. No, it's not nice. It's never nice. <laughs> this episode <laughs> terrifies me. So you're scared of it for Ernest Man reasons. I just, I have nothing to say about this song that <laughs> is any different than what I would have said about this song in the seventh grade. <laughs> you know what, though? I completely agree. Like, <laughs> I was like, I was like writing down notes and being like, this song makes me want to start crying. <laughs> and also I was thinking like, we're probably going to talk about it for what, four and a half hours. And yeah. <laughs> no matter what we say or what we do, it's not going to feel like we've done justice to this song, which actually, and I'm the same as you in that my favorite songs are constantly changing. But when this song is on, it's definitely my favorite song in the world. Yeah, dude, I, I completely agree. That's I was explaining to Ashley before we started recording. I was like, I'm so stressed because the, the big songs, sometimes it feels like they're hard to kind of get your arms around. But even with those ones, often those aren't like my favorites. So you can kind of be cheeky, at least in a way that provides some distance that might create comedy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Whereas this is just like, not only is this my favorite Blink song, but I truly think this is my favorite song of all time, of all the bands, of all the music. Yeah. And like this, th- that's this really is just hard. going to be... This is just going to be two mediocre white guys in their 30s talking about how good a pop punk song is. No, that. Like, that's so bad. I don't want to listen to that. It's, should we just stop the tape? I think we should. I think people should just know, like, you know what's happening and, um, <laughs> you know, go go do something worthwhile. Listen, listen to something that matters. Okay, we took a little break, so now we're done talking about the song <laughs> itself. And yeah. uh, <laughs> Back to talking about Skate Kitchen. Yeah. So yeah, the movie's good. Um no, let's let's do it. Whatever. We can we can talk about <laughs> how we like a song. That's okay. Okay. We're allowed. Okay. Look, you've gone too okay. far into my zone where you're afraid to be a, I'll say it. I'll say it's the chicken chicken soup of <laughs> mac and cheese uh powders combined <laughs> we, of the soul. Like you take the package of Lipton's <laughs> chicken noodle soup <laughs> and then pour it into mac and cheese and mix it together and oh, that's what the song is wow that's true and then you eat it through your heart <laughs> you literally yeah. you, you cut a hole in your heart with a knife <laughs> even when you say that you sound earnest i know because <laughs> i mean it i like that's what this song makes me feel like <laughs> Oh, God. I mean, it's too good. And also, this was, like I said recently, this was this was the CD that I first, like, engaged with them with. So this is the first thing you hear. And it is it is the perfect – I mean, we said this about Dumpweed, too, but they're so good at doing first songs that are, like, a thesis statement. Yeah. I mean, this song is just, like, such an incredible level set. And this is really is exactly what we kind of said about, about Dumpweed for the album to the point where – this is one of the only songs that I like remember hearing. Like I remember every tactile thing uh, about listening to it, opening the CD, like seeing the CD, putting it in my discman. I know the stickers that I have on that discman. I remember like getting through this song and being, I think I talked about this on the My Age podcast. I was like literally being driven to physiotherapy by my mom. And like, <laughs> I didn't get through the whole record. I got through like the first three songs. And like, I, rem- I remember the moment I heard this and like just being, not having not heard anything like it before because it was so much faster than like the sort of pop punk that was on the radio. It was so much faster than Green Day. Um, there wasn't like mainstream pop punk that had like that full on skate punk beat in it. Yeah. And just like melodically, it was so much more aggressive than damn it. And so like even if that that was obviously my way in through hearing that on the radio, it was still like so unexpected. And you were like, how the fuck is this even possible? Like I, I truly well, also, remember yeah. everything about that moment. And that's that's, that's a, wild to that's me. That's so good. I, I mean, I kind of agree because I remember it standing out to me like, oh, my God, these two guys have the perfect voices for each other. Mm -hmm. It's like they perfectly match each other. Like, Marx is more deep, and then, like, Tom DeLonge literally sounds like a screeching weasel, actually. (laughs) Not the (laughs) band, but he sounds like an actual screeching weasel. Yeah. Um, And then I thought, 
wow, I bet you every song's going to have this back and forth on it. And then they kind of don't really at all. Like, there's you can count how many songs actually have this back and forth interplay. And it's kind of weird that they didn't milk it more. I, you know, it's funny. That was one of the things that I remember that's like not like a, a negative, but the closest thing to a sort of negative association with this song, which is we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about how much we both love Dude Ranch. But I, I actually do remember subsequently getting through the entire record and until I had fully like worn it out and love every grew to love every song on it, I actually remember being kind of disappointed that they didn't replicate what they were doing on that. And this comes back, I think, a lot to like my infatuation with musicals, which like constantly have, you know, they end with like 30 different vocal parts all kind of intermingling. And it's also subsequently why I think I fell really hard for bands like Taking Back Sunday because I was like so many different vocal parts. It's so sick. <laughs> it's just like Starlight Express. Um, yeah. But the, this to me was like actually very kind of advanced melodically, not that I would have like cared to find a way to express that um, in 1997. But like that interplay is so kind of like absent from the rest of this record. And then every time they bring it back, I'm always like, yes, this is what I want. But yeah, they didn't milk it. Right. No. And, and that's why. And but that, I guess that's also why it makes it such a good thesis statement, because it's not every song's going to be like this. It's like this is a taste of every single thing that you're about to get. Yeah, from this totally. Perfect album. Um, but then when California came out, I was like, oh, maybe Mark finally figured out that like the interplay is fun and that's why he does it on every song. But then we've later learned that it's like legal, <laughs> it's, it's legal play as opposed to fun vocal interplay. <laughs> it's like, what a, what a fucking, uh, what a fall from grace. But yeah, you keep talking about the melody and what I think is really interesting about the melody is that it's almost hard to par, like, it's hard to remember. It's hard to parse the melody. Well, the verse melody the- for sure. Yeah, like it's kind of like it's kind of random where it almost now in retrospect feels more like a rap song. <laughs> yeah. Like especially the you got you got you got to help me out is like do they just not have enough words or are they doing that on purpose? The whole thing just sounds like very I mean the whole song itself feels like an explosion of energy. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting cuz that that sort of like way of delivering kind of punk vocals which doesn't it, it doesn't feel like hardcore in terms of the the sort of like beat of it it does feel very like vaguely rap ish and so it kind of reminds me of uh fuck the border by propagandi which like you know Todd has said that parts of that are him basically trying to rap like he's obviously not very sincerely trying to turn propagandi into like a rap rap punk pop metal band <laughs> but like <laughs> That's that's what he's trying to express. And it feels sort of similar where you get this like sort of staccato delivery that isn't the same as like what was happening in hardcore at that time and yeah. lacks lacks the melody of the chorus or obviously like other Blink songs on this album. Well, I mean, I guess also maybe that that staccato delivery could be a little bit of Tim Armstrong. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's hard to again, I'm, like I'm sure this just came from their subconscious. You, but definitely but, you can picture like, you got the got the got to help me out. <laughs> yeah. And I try not to argue. Like, it's actually very Tim Armstrong. And also it's kind of just, <laughs> especially it's Tim Armstrong because it's pretty odd for them. In terms of like pop punk lyrics, it's odd to repeat the first half of a line rather than the second half, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yo, now <laughs> so, I'm just yeah. picturing it with like a kind of groovy organ underneath it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Turns out Pathetic is one of the worst Blink-182 songs. <laughs> yeah, we might feel that way at the end of this episode. But the Rancid thing is is interesting only because when I told Ashley this was a song that we were doing, she was like, oh, I actually really like that song. Like, that's that's one of the songs that she knows and likes, even though you would never be able to convincingly argue that the song sounds anything like Rancid. Maybe it's because the vocal delivery borrows a little more from those things that um, non-Blink heads... Because I feel like Rancid and Blink are like, there's not, in my mind, despite being very obviously like you know, pop punk bands, not a, not a ton of overlap. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of true. I mean, it's the word punk when you're like 15 just makes sense. And then as you get older and if you're still thinking about punk in your 30s, which is very sad and I don't recommend, <laughs> um, then you realize that it's really confusing how all of these things kind of exist in the same world. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Where you're like, okay, so the Dropkick Murphys and also Reviver and, (laughs) you know, whatever shows, uh, you know, Stuck in the City is putting on in Toronto. Like that's, those things are not part of a logical continuum. Yeah. Um, So I feel like 
probably you have you're the kind of person who remembers lyrics probably or you as you would probably say like you have the lyrics calligraphied on your aorta or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> They've been uh yeah, that fine. Fine. <laughs> But I actually have a really hard time remembering lyrics, even of my most favorite songs, or even of songs I've written. I can never remember lyrics. I don't really pay attention to lyrics or care, and I actually resent writing lyrics. All these kinds of things. So I've never been able to make out what the second line of the song is. So I've always thought this is my favorite song, but I've never been able to make it out. And every time I read it, I instantly forget that it's a loser, comma, a bum <laughs> is what she called me. That is such a clumsy lyric, and it's really charming, but it's impossible for my brain to remember that. Yeah, like you think of the opportunities of those syllables, a loser, a bums. Like, you, what? <laughs> And this is clearly that a band. Actually, again, it's, it's very Tim Armstrong again, <laughs> but like late pirate shanty Tim Armstrong. Yeah, yeah. It's, I get that like Rhyme Zone didn't exist when Dude Ranch was being written, but, you know, this is a band that managed to work in commiserating like only one album later. So clearly the thesaurus is their friend. Yeah. And I know. <laughs> to, to to jam in a loser a bum on the second line. But it feels very you know, like realistic. This this person being like, you loser, you bum. And you're like, well, gotta transcribe that exactly as it happened. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I know I'm pathetic and knew when she said it, she called me a loser, a bum when I drove her home. Like even that would be better than having this like apostrophe S thing on bum. It's just like it's impossible to make out what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so good. It's so like perfectly clumsy though. Like it, exactly. it's just a, a a different, more mature version of this band. Like you think that for a second Feldy would see that line and be like, Hell yeah, that passes muster. <laughs> yeah, this is like the bottom rung of the shit ladder that we've learned about. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like this is the sort of just weird way of writing that gets bred out of you as you become more professional. And, you know, that's good for a lot of things, but I think for what uh, you and I love about this band, like this is such an ideal distillation of it. I mean, not to argue with what you're saying, but we still did get the line, life is too short to last long. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) But the other, the other lyric that really stands out to me in this song, which I think is like, actually genius and amazing and so like i mean i don't know people debate what the song is about i think regardless of what it's about if you take this line out of the song it's kind of everything that it that it means to be a person who thinks you're part of a subculture which is i think i'm different but i'm the same and i'm wrong Mm -hmm. that is so good dude the chorus lyrics in this song are so fucking perfect. Like the verses almost don't matter because the verses certainly position it as a, like a sort of love lost type song, which is never how it's like ultimately resonated. I think for me emotionally, and I suspect based on what you said, maybe it's the same thing for you. Like this was a hundred percent the anthem for you as a kid who you were like, I am, I think I'm different. (laughs) I don't like (laughs) hockey, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And I think it's like, this is the part where I want to, you know, like do this like unnecessary sort of like (laughs) performative check of shit and just be like, of course, like people like you and I feeling like we're isolated in any capacity is hilarious now. Like I recognize that, but the fact is like those emotions are still super real when you're that age and you're like, I like things that the other like people that I go to school with don't like. And, you know, and especially at this age, because I heard this when I was like, I was in fucking middle school. So the, I didn't go to school with like punks and I didn't go to shows and the internet was basically having an ICQ account. You weren't really able to do the same kind of community building that I, th- I think is sort of one of the upsides of everyone being online all the time for just sort of kids yeah. in different cities to be able to sort of find people who are like them. Yeah, I think that us against them mentality is, well, it still exists, but it's like people who are, Ariana Grande fans fighting against people who are a different kind of Ariana Grande fan or something. I don't know. It's <laughs> right. like so weird. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not try to wait. Yeah. Wait into, I guess the contemporary. But I just love that. Like this is, 
This is basically the first mission statement of Blink-182 that so many people our age heard. Mm -hmm. And yet already Tom DeLonge has the self-awareness to be like, I'm actually just the same as everyone else. (laughs) Like somehow in 1997, he had the foresight to say that. Yeah. And I guess also on this album is Lemmings, which we've talked about being like this farewell to the idea of punk. And I think this is the same kind of thing where they're like, we're actually just the same as everyone else. Like who gives a shit? Yeah. I I love that line. Yeah, totally. But it still feels it, it's it doesn't feel like an attack on that notion. And that's why I think it's so effective. It's this idea of like I, the sort of contradiction in it, I think, just so perfectly captures the utter confusion of being that age and trying to figure out kind of where where you fit into your school or your scene or whatever it is, because it yeah. doesn't it doesn't feel like they're parodying or mocking kids who are like, I'm fucking punk. No, exactly. But it's just, it's complete self-awareness. I guess the the overarching theme of the song and why it's so, um, why it resonates so much is because it's so self-deprecating, right? Mm-hmm. And that is a perfect self-deprecating line where you're like, well, this guy is self-aware enough to know that he's kind of just like everyone else, but he's still like cool as hell. <laughs> right. And then you're the same as, because this is the, the way I always interpret it is that I thought it was funny that like when you'd go to a punk show, you'd have individuals who, you know, maybe had the a- appearance of nonconformity in their respective communities. But then you like get to the show and everyone looks the exact same. And that's always been and remains like very funny to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then it's even cornier to be like, uh, like I laugh. You laugh at me because I'm different. I laugh at you because you're all the same. Right. <laughs> but that's why I think this is perfect because it's not. It's not that. It's not some like weird incel manifesto. It's like, <laughs> but we are still bonded by this thing. Like it is simultaneously a like recognition of the, um, just the the shit that's inherently funny about outsider culture, but that also like being part of an outsider culture is still like a real and meaningful and defining part of your identity. Yeah, totally. And so in that sense, it actually, it, it, what you said about it sort of aging well is it's not like going back and listening to like a taking back Sunday song and just being like, I can't ever imagine feeling this strongly about anything. This is insane. (laughs) Um, (laughs) This is an irrational way to act and, and sing uh, my good man. Um, (laughs) Whereas this, like, I listen to now, and obviously there's, like, tremendous, like, unending nostalgia that goes along with every single time you hear the song. But it, it, it isn't goofy. Like, it's not that you listen back to it and you're like, oh, God, I was so sincere. I was so whatever. Like, it's a very sincere song, but it has that, um, that wink sort of just baked into the entire narrative, which makes it totally. okay to enjoy at 33, I think, as a person <laughs> who enjoys it at 33. Um, what I'm sure it's not literal, but I've never really understood what the line, don't pull me down, this is where I belong, really means. Because if you're admitting that you're pathetic, then aren't you already down? But if you say, don't pull me down, this is where I belong, then you're kind of above <laughs> in terms of height. Mm, maybe you could, you could still be tall and pathetic, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. I think I always interpreted it as, and this is perhaps part of the fact that, like, this band was not necessarily this, like, advanced in terms of how they were sort of structuring the themes of a song. And so maybe it's a contradiction, like, between those different ideas, but that, like, you will... If if you're trying if you're trying to like be cool and punk, there'll be someone that'll be like making fun of you for how you dress at your school, or like your parents might not be down with your like studded belt, and you just gotta you just gotta do you, man. That's kind of always <laughs> how I interpreted that. Yeah. Okay. So like, this is where I belong is like in the scene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's get, the song is getting bad the more we talk about it. <laughs> yeah. We should. I I feel like it's as much like those lyrics. I have felt like, cause I think sometimes really good lyrics are just like some hyper evocative words strung together in a way that sounds good. And when you start to really probe them, it, it kind of falls apart or you, you attach these meanings that are potentially embarrassing. <laughs> and I think maybe Blink has tried <laughs> to do that. Like you talk about life is too short to last long. Like that's them sort of maybe trying to recreate that. Like, Oh, I'm, 
I'm confused. And so maybe there's depth and meaning in that. And I, to me, this was just like a series of really strong phrases that like might not totally make yeah. sense. But you're like, fucking, yeah, don't pull me down. I belong here. And I'm like, also, I'm the same as everyone else, even though I think I'm kind of like cool and weird and random. Um, <laughs> Plus, it works really well with the chord progression, which is going down while they say that. Yeah. Oh, my God. (laughs) There's also, and this is where, like, okay, so I I need to get through this part because I feel like we're talking about the chorus right now. um, And this is, there's just no avoiding, like, real earnestman hours here. So I had asked you a little while ago, uh, I think I read it, like, on vacation in the winter, uh, that movie Priest Daddy by, or movie, the book Priest Daddy by Patricia Lockwood. Right. Um, which is like this like fantastic memoir. It's like a very funny book um, about just like her life growing up, the daughter of a, of a priest, uh, the name pretty much describes it. But when I was reading oh, I it, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's very <laughs> clever. Um, but there's this like bit in it where she describes like learning how to sing in the church. And it's this kind of whole thing where she sort of describes like, the way that you would learn to sing so that uh, you would, you would abandon the final consonant. So the words kind of just like keep going forever. And I'm literally going to read this because I remember reading this in like January and thinking this reminds me so much of what I love about this song. And so like, forgive me, Josiah. Wow. A book reading. I know. I'm so sorry, but it's just, I don't fucking care. This song is like too fucking good. And this, and this just like reminded me too much of it. So my teachers taught me to abandon the final consonant so that certain songs never ended so that you walked out of the room and into the sunlight with the song still continuing behind you. And I know, I know Josiah, don't say anything. No one make a Twitter account about this. (laughs) But that last belong that they do at the end of every chorus, like never closes you never get the proper resolution on it. It's just a big, long uh, O uh, yeah, that yeah. kind of goes on forever. And there's just like this sense in this song, and especially I think as a young person hearing it and it being about identity in this like really vague way and just like at this time where you're literally trying to figure out where you like literally belong in the world, to have this song that just sort of has this sense of being so immediate and so fast and so brief and so concise and yet like there's this element inside of it that like never concludes. And I think like that is one of the most like powerful, subtle musical things that happens in this song. It's just this idea that like somewhere (laughs) they are still singing that belong, you know, like it's 1996. They're they're tracking (laughs) somewhere in San Diego and there's just like that belong (laughs) has like never reached its, its conclusion. Well, I think actually there's, and I don't really know, enough to say it intelligently, but I'm going to try anyways. But I think that there's some music theory stuff going on in here that also fits with that, um, especially the the chord progression at the verses. It starts with that chord that's a half step down from the root note, which is the same thing they do on dick lips. But mm-hmm. like when it, it starts like a half step down, that sort of feels like you're in this continuum. So when you hear that chord yeah. progression, you're like, that can just go on forever. Um, another song that really does that for me is... Um, the song Da Vinci by Weezer on, mm-hmm. uh, uh, what's that one called? The third most recent album. <laughs> Everything will be all right in the end. Okay. Yeah. That one, that album is amazing. And especially that song has this chord progression where like it literally could go on forever. And it's not very often that I will actually listen to a song multiple times in a row. But when people use that chord progression, you just feel like this literally will always be satisfying to listen to totally. because it starts in this we, I don't know. It's the way that your brain processes it or something. And the guitar lead is actually very similar, right? Because this is not like the full sort of like hammer on Tom guitar part. Like it's actually really open and it kind of does the same thing where it's sort of like there isn't a lot of like floating Blink-182 guitar leads. There's a lot of like, you know, aggressive, inventive, staccato guitar leads. And this one, again, feels unlike a lot of other stuff that's on this album. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wrote down a, a nice interaction that I read about the lyrics since we're getting out of the lyric section. Um, this is from songmeanings.net. I feel like, I feel like you should read both of these comments that I just sent you. <laughs> Why? Cause they're like super earnest or something. <laughs> well, it's just, it's just really, it's really, you'll see, just, just go ahead and read it. Okay. Anyone that says Blink only writes about farting and masturbating obviously never read or tried to understand half their lyrics. They really have some good stuff. 
especially on Dude Ranch, but their new CDs have some great meaningful songs too. And that's from Jack Booty on. And then Megan324 said, I totally agree, Jack Booty. <laughs> Does it really, like, do you think in 2002 when <laughs> Megan wrote that, was she being sincere or was she making fun of the fact that someone named Jack Booty <laughs> said that? Written about meaningful lyrics? I don't know. Maybe she just <laughs> wanted to tag them, make sure that they saw it. But I got to say, I'm with Jack Booty on this. <laughs> Je suis Jack Booty. <laughs> You remember when ever, okay, when everyone did Je suis Charlie? Yeah. Um, when that stupid thing happened, where everyone was like, I love this racist magazine. <laughs> we've <laughs> all now, so- like, we've accepted that that magazine, that certainly no one ever deserves violence to be brought into their workplace, but that that magazine is super <laughs> racist, like, right? Everyone is so stupid that they can't <laughs> process that maybe both sides are bad. Yeah. Sometimes. Like, all of these things could be true. <laughs> they should not have been attacked, but you don't have to, like, be like, je suis, you know, <laughs> la rebel or whatever. Anyways, one time I was driving and it was like so disappointing because I, I don't know, you're not, you're not as like, as logged in as I am, I feel like. But when something happens that like I know would be so funny to post online, but I can't post it, it's so upset. It's like the one that got away. (laughs) Right. And I was like, I was waiting at a red light and I noticed that this minivan in front of me, like a (laughs) shitty, like late eighties minivan there, the rear window was tinted. So A, I couldn't. I couldn't get a good photo that way, but also <laughs> there's just sweet Charlie sticker was a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper printout of a tweet of a JPEG. Oh my <laughs> so it's like a tiny thing that says just sweet Charlie with like three retweets listed underneath it. It was so <laughs> tiny and shitty. Oh, it was the best. That was like a perfect uh, metaphor for that style of, <laughs> of activism. Yeah. That's, Oh, that's very beautiful. I love um, okay, well, we Twitter. were talking a little bit about punk stuff, and I think this would be a good time to read this little section from uh, the Dude Ranch Wikipedia. So I think it's pretty interesting, specifically, and I can't remember if we've read this on the pod before or if I've just used it elsewhere, but um, Blink originally did want to sign with Epitaph, and then it just kind of never happened. Hmm. And so they signed with MCA, and everyone thought that they were sellouts. But this is what Tom has always said. I try and tell kids the Clash, Sex Pistols, and the Ramones did it, so how come we can't? If people are bummed, we don't care. It's normally critics, older critics. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, I feel like we're kind of in an era right now, again, where the concept of selling out doesn't matter to anyone at all. Yeah, it's weird. It's like selling out doesn't matter, but the label thing weirdly does again. I think you have so many people that, because of all the different avenues that exist for music distribution, have avoided major labels again in a way that is maybe reminiscent of the, the kind of rise of independent labels in the eighties and nineties. And that's always one of the funny things about saying like the clash were on a major label because like literally independent record labels, while they obviously existed, you know, from the dawn of recorded music, weren't uh, a real option for bands until, you know, smashed by the offspring, the invention of the independent record label. (laughs) I mean, again, it's just so funny to imagine Dude Ranch as the sellout album. I know it's um, it's hilarious. We're like the the idea that this record was a major label debut is sort of funny when you compare it to Enema, because I don't yeah. understand how the label like how much more money did they spend on Enema? Because well, speaking of uh, speaking of people who've rejected the pod for the sake of transparency, I will say that Mark Trumbino rejected appearing on the pod as well. But I believe you did say he politely declined. He was very nice about it, but I mean, it's it's still, I know rejection when I see it. But but was he like, I got to tend to my donut shop? What was his excuse? He was like, I can't wait to listen to your podcast and I have nothing to add to the conversation. (laughs) Something like that. I don't know. It was nice. Well, you should send him this part of this episode because (laughs) the, the sound of this record, the fact that this is a major label record. So it, 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 like functionally like sounds consistent and good. Like it's not, it doesn't have the, the sort of scrappiness of a proper independent punk album that sometimes makes those things like mostly good for nostalgia's sake. Yeah. Like this still sounds good 21 years later, but it also sounds like really real. Like it sounds like there's the speed, like the fills on this song don't sound like they've been run through like 
a, any sort of processing. Like it sounds like a song that is sort of barreling out of control, but is like so fat despite not having a hundred guitar layers on it. So I know it sounds. This is like the benchmark of what every album should sound like. Although I also feel that way about lots of other Jerry <laughs> Finn productions and pretty much every, pretty much almost anything Blink One Eighty Two. While we're talking about it, is the best thing I've ever heard in my life. Of course, so. yeah. But Trombino <laughs> did an amazing job. And while we're sad you're not on the pod. Uh, Respect Mark Trombino and your donuts forever. Also, the singer of Piss Jeans rejected coming on the pod. That's um, so. so rude. <laughs> no, it's completely fine. Don't you? Um, <laughs> you have to say yes to everything that you get asked to do. You have to say yes to every podcast. Well, the only thing, the only reason that the Piss Jeans guy made me mad was the other day he tweeted, I've never been asked on a podcast before. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to flip a table right now. You should definitely become a Piss Jeans pod truther. <laughs> I did. I replied from the pod. Did you? Called him a liar. <laughs> yeah. Did he block you? Uh, no, he fa- He just did a fave and oh, moved on. Bullshit. But yeah, I don't know. I think I'm going to start. There's enough. There's enough great guests that we do get that I think it's fun to start to start saying who says no. <laughs> yeah, I think we got to like be uh, all about radical transparency on Blink One Fifty Five. Yeah. Unless uh, it's about our emotions. You know, we need to we keep an ironic veneer. I don't know, man. I did a book reading about 10 minutes ago, so I'm, I'm not holding well, up well. The other reason I brought up this passage was because I thought it was really funny that MCA at the time was like, they're having a dead spell, it says, and the music industry referred to them as the Musician Cemetery of America. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's like... <laughs> true or is that just something that some <laughs> it's like, wikipedia like a joker sticker. yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like found on road dead <laughs> right <or> whatever <laughs> like there's i can see a i can see calvin peeing on the mca logo <laughs> whoever wrote this but the, but the real funny thing is so like scott rayner really wanted them to go with epitaph um and so when they went with mca instead he was kind of bummed out and you should read that quote at the end of this paragraph because it's like again scott rayner is so smart and like so that now there's someone who should come on the pod he's so well spoken and smart it didn't so what is he saying uh sorry rayner was not however difficult it's a weird phrase i didn't measure success in terms of oppositional credibility I loved being on the radio and MTV. We were certified products of pop culture, born and bred in suburbia. Jesus Christ. (laughs) He's so smart. (laughs) Oppositional credibility. Like, hello, Certified products of pop culture, born and bred in suburbia. Sounds like an academic paper about Blink-182, not something (laughs) that the drummer of Blink-182 should say when they don't sign to Epitaph. Has he secretly gotten it the entire time? I mean, obviously, you can hear it in his drums. His <laughs> drums are barreling forward with the self-awareness that he knows what he's supposed to be doing. That's it. This is a man being pulled along by destiny. <laughs> Holy shit, Scott Rayner. Scott Rayner, come on the pod. Come on, Scott. Come on. Come on. So You don't, you don't want to be in the... Well, I mean, it's a pretty cool club. Mark Trombino and Smash Mouth and the guy from Piss Jeans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a cool no club. <sighs> yeah. Um, so, I don't know. Someone's done a super cut of how Blink-182 has written so many songs in the key of B. It's kind of satisfying, but it's like... There's only so many keys. And there's probably one that they were good at singing at that time. Yeah, that's, so that's kind of how that works, right? Like, there's only, like... I don't, I can't count, but there's, you know, there's not that many keys really. Do you know what key your voice sounds good in? Uh, well, I learned that <laughs> it's really hard to sing when I write songs in D. Oh. And I learned that after I wrote and recorded them and released them. <laughs> right. And then tried to play them live. I was <laughs> like, okay, I really got to do some acrobatics here. That's where, but like, don't most bands record in a key that makes their voice sound like real good because it's like pushed into your upper upper register and you get some nice cracks. And then when you when you perform live, you just do everything a half step down or a full step down. Yeah, like probably I should have figured all that stuff out. But like I said, lyrics are always secondary to me, and I I I just resent the idea of recording vocals ever. <laughs> so then I just don't think about it. Do you ever think of like giving the reins over, letting someone else in the band who maybe cares about lyrics write them? <laughs> no. I think also uh, like I don't I don't hate my lyrics when I'm done, but my indifference is because I hate the process so much and I hate like writing something down and feeling like a grade nine poetry student <laughs> right. the whole time. But it, and then it's just like this like <laughs> this self examination where you just hate yourself. 
for a few days. <laughs> right. But and hold then on. you have to record, so it has to be good. Right. But do you think, because you said you don't, you don't hate your lyrics when you're done, but it sounds like you hate a lot of other lyrics. So do you think that you write the only good lyrics? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I just think most people don't hate themselves enough and get embarrassment <laughs> chills by their own actions right. enough. So, so I feel like I, I'm not saying that I think my lyrics are perfect or amazing, but I've made sure that they don't make me feel gross. Right. And I think most people skip that step. Right. You should, people should feel more embarrassed about the things that they do. <laughs> yes, exactly. More, more people, shame is your solution more shame for is the a good world's idea. problems. Yeah. But anyways, so I don't know if that, I mean, they, Blink-182 wrote some songs in the key of B, so that's a thing that happened. <laughs> Great fact. Oh, you know what else I was going to say? I, I think I've thought of another reason um, why Dude Ranch is come. Go on. Um, it's because it's, it's a release that feels really good. <laughs> 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 That's good, I was man. That's, thinking about that last night when I was really falling asleep, I was like, "Oh yeah, there you go. It's a release." <laughs> right. I'm so glad that these are the things that keep you up at night. Like, what's another uh, dude ranch has come joke I can add to the <laughs> to the pile? Add to the pile. <laughs> add to the pool. <laughs> oh shit. Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's inevitable that we have to do this. So why don't we just why don't we just watch some old videos of them playing it and then get really emotional? Are we gonna happy? cry? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, the Warp Tour Atlanta video is the greatest one of all time, specifically because of the Josie performance, but we'll talk about that on the episode. I don't want to spoil it, but in fact, I shouldn't have even mentioned this because now you're going to all go look it up and <laughs> it'll be spoiled. But I mean, <laughs> or should I just explain it now? Because we're going to have to talk about lots of other stuff. I think we got to tell you. I think you just got to explain it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a dude that runs out on the stage wearing an E.T. mask, which is pretty significant because the E.T. is a big part of uh, our life here. It's Sarah's favorite movie. And so to have someone wearing an E.T. mask dancing on stage during Blink-182 is one thing, but also the person is completely naked otherwise and swanging their big old dick around <laughs> while the band performs Josie and, like, grinding up on them and stuff. And it's just really, really, really good. And, of course, dicks also play a big part in your life as well. You have one. <laughs> I mean, you're making some pretty big assumptions here. But. Oh, wow. My apologies. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, let's. we're not going to watch that part right now, but I've already spoiled it for when we do the Josie next week. I feel like that's like um, a legendary video, though. Yeah, it's so good. And also, Tom really looks good in a plain white T-shirt. I'm mm. thinking right now while I look at this. Um, plain white tees. And I forgot that before he got a sleeve, he just had that really cool racing stripe tattoo. Ooh, yeah. Plain white tees are good, man. Not the band, the tees. <laughs> Mark's got All a right, sick Disneyland shirt on. So this, yeah, I know. This is crazy. So this is 97 Warp Tour, San Francisco. Okay. Oh, I'm not even playing the right video that I just spoiled. That was the next one on the list. <laughs> <laughs> this is Warp Tour, San Francisco. Oh, yeah. Sorry. At the start, he says, he says, we have a new record coming out, and this is the first song from it. Oh, my God. Like, what? Come on, that's too good. Anyway, All right, let's listen to this. want to listen to the whole song now oh my god like it's yeah i was like i just hope you play the same like the same like just play the entire thing (laughs) i also forgot to mention what one thing i like about this song is that i think i think this might be the only blink 182 song that has an actual honest to god breakdown in it (laughs) like it has like a part where you could you could feasibly mosh and pick up change <laughs> when it goes to halftime and does the sort of chugging guitars. You feel like this is like the closest you get to like loving terror, <laughs> like having that yeah. sort of into the song. And like it has that part where people can do that sort of weird, like 
two-step walk that they do, which is just so... I mean, I don't know if I've... Re- I haven't really talked about this too much, but I used to live with, like, actual real hardcore kids. And one of my roommates would get up to go to work um, as, like, a metal worker, and I would hear him cranking... What's that one Bane song that was, like, a huge hit? Can we start again? Go back to what it meant back then or whatever. Is that it? I, I, don't, yeah. I honestly never listened he'd put to that, Bane. He'd put that song on at, like, 7 a.m. in our apartment, and I'd go <laughs> look in the kitchen to see what was going on, and he'd be practicing his mosh moves before work. Hell, yeah. <laughs> like, so good. That's I mean, so, it's so great. Like, it's, it's so funny and also so great. It's, like, the Can perfect you mosh? mix of Can those you? two worlds. No, Can I can't. You? I've always been too much of a fucking, like... At the time, I think my defense mechanism was to laugh at it, even though it's, like, the sickest thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, it looks so good. But um, this song has an honest mosh part that you could do that. You could you could feasibly do the, the Bane dancing, too. The next time that you, uh, like, that we travel to Las Vegas or whatever to see them, I think we should try to, like, really start a proper, like, you know, pick it up <laughs> pit <laughs> during the song. Oh, it's so good. See All how right, people well, react to it. Can you imagine, though, like, so they're saying, they, they just like, this is the first song off our new record. It's a new song. Like, can you imagine just being at Warped Tour? It looks like they're playing a tiny fucking stage, hearing that song. Like, it would be like seeing God, you know, where yeah, you're like. even, I love how the person who shot that was tr- kind of trying to follow along with the lyrics, but they didn't realize the call and response until sort of the third line. Totally. <laughs> Like, I'd be like, I'll follow you into the fucking dark at that point, you know? <laughs> How big was that Death Cab song for you? Oh, uh, not big, actually. I don't think I liked them by then. I was like an early Death Cabman. Like, oh, yeah. we have the facts. I'm like, I think that's a really good record. Yeah. It's not, though. Like, if you put it on now, you're like, oh, never mind. I was no, it's the, it's the big pop records that are good, but I was trying to be cool. All right. Let's go to the Atlanta one. I think this is either before or after the dick. It looks like Scott might have dyed black hair in this one, which is a sort of precursor to current death rock Scott, who I really just have the utmost respect for and hope that he's doing great. Even if he never comes on the pod and doesn't want to revisit us, this era with us, I think Scott rules, and I just wish him all the best. Hell yeah. I do hope that eventually whoever runs the Facebook account for his current band relents and at least at least says no to us. <laughs> yeah. So that we can add them to the pile of the reject pile. Exactly. But as it stands now, they are like the end of the chorus of Pathetics are sort of still going on forever <laughs> in our hearts. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is from the same year, but in Atlanta on the Warped Tour. God, the way it goes from the like, <laughs> the way it goes from the halftime part back into the punk beat, like before the chorus is done, like it's not that like the chorus is like halftime and then it's like back to the punk beat, like it's not as simple as like structurally as just being like A B C A B C or whatever. It's like the the drum beat is sort of not mapped to what exactly the the bass and the guitar and the vocals are doing. And it just, it yeah. adds to that feeling of like constant propulsion because it's moving when you wouldn't normally expect it to move. And these I videos need, look so like just, good. I just need to like sit here for a second. <laughs> just like think about life. It's, uh, <laughs> Oh God. Um, yeah. I mean, fuck. I don't, I don't this I don't I don't know what to say this so I just watched a, a documentary this morning about the source family um which like it was like a 70s you know one of these like just um kind of pseudo religious spiritual cult things led by a guy with a beard and long hair but one of the sort of particulars of the source family was that they had like a psychedelic rock band called Yahawa 13 that is kind of <laughs> very highly regarded in sort of psychedelic garage rock circles in the documentary, Billy Corgan 
like has a 10 second sound bite of like, you can literally hear God in their music. <laughs> You're like, that's so sick. But all of these cult documentaries, whether it's like, you know, wild, wild country or this source family doc kind of have this pivotal moment where these, or, uh, or, um, the evening news. <laughs> right. Hell yeah, man. But like, you see these, these people who are otherwise kind of normal say like, I saw this person, I saw this, this guru and I knew this was my life. Like I knew that I had to follow them. They were my spiritual father on earth. And you're, and, and it's presented in the context of like, these are, these people are out of their fucking minds. They're part of a cult. But I feel like watching these videos, I, like I see this and I'm like, Tom and Mark are my heavenly, f- and Scott. Maybe Scott <laughs> is my heavenly, fa- like spiritual father on earth. I don't know. Well, I think every cult needs like the charismatic ones, which would be especially Tom and Mark. But mm-hmm. then you also need like the brains, which is clearly Scott. Like I just cannot believe that Scott has this understanding of where they stand in the world of punk in such a like, almost cynical way that that's what would make him kind of the brains of the cult. He would be so, I, I do genuinely hope that we get him on because I think if we were to like Mark, you know, sure. It'd be nice to have him on the, on the pod. Like that'd be cool. But he did offer in the, in week one, right. We (laughs) completely ruined that. (laughs) It happened too soon. It freaked both of us out. So after (laughs) denying him in the first week, uh, it may never happen, but I know how that would go. Like it would be probably charming, but ultimately that's like a press trained, you know, charming guy. Yeah. Like there's no, they've never released a bad song or made a misstep. (laughs) No, exactly. The line, the current lineup is how it was always intended to be like that sort of vibe. Totally. And like, Whereas Scott would say some, like, deeply, like, intelligent shit about the male psyche in suburbia. <laughs> yeah. I feel like Scott is on the level that I think that we are on, you know? Like, where you can be critical about this thing while also understanding that it's the best thing and that making fun of a song here and there is, like, important for sort of deepening your love. Or maybe Scott doesn't even like any of it, though, because, like, I feel like if you're going to be hanging out with, like, charged hair death punk guys, you're probably not, like, thinking about baggy dickies. (laughs) I don't know. I think everyone's thinking about baggy dickies, Josiah. (laughs) (laughs) There's an interesting thing in one of those videos, too, where, like, the guitar lead is a little different. Like, he sort of plays it, like, he goes up. There's a, there's a few yeah. higher notes in there that... Oh, yeah. Someone's going to get mad also because we, we didn't play the Mark, Tom, and Travis show version, which I think he plays the guitar slightly differently on there, but there's, we got a lot to get through still. I, I, yeah, this one's probably pretty dense, but it's, but it's interesting hearing it in that context of like, oh, like there's like some minor evolutions that have occurred to get us the, the perfect final product of Pathetic as it exists well, on Well, it's hard D-Branch. to tell if, he's, if he was just fucking it up or if he was doing that on purpose, but either way, that sort of nuanced balance between fucking it up and getting it perfect and anything could fall apart any minute further adds to my theory that Blink-182 and early Modest Mouse are not so different. Oh, yeah. People have been <laughs> loving the Modest Mouse talk on the Twitter, eh? Oh, yeah, and uh, The Nation has made, like, a massive emo Spotify playlist um, somewhere. I don't know how <laughs> so to find sick. it. Yeah, I think I'm I'd, not going to listen. I'd, I don't want to hear a bunch of emo songs. Hell yeah. I'm going to listen to the shit out of that. Is that all? That's all <laughs> coming from the unofficial Facebook group, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so overwhelming. <laughs> it's just too much content. You know what I think I'm struggling with and I'm already like feeling kind of regret for in terms of how I'm like trying to talk about the song is <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just like, I'm swimming in shit right now is like, this song, yeah, man. <laughs> sorry, man, it's just, it's, uh, you know, the plumbing, the whole flooding thing that's been happening in Toronto. It's a problem. It's, it's real. We don't invest in infrastructure here, uh, which is why I'll be voting for Jennifer Keysmet uh, in the October civic election here in Toronto. Just a little bit of civic politics for Bill Billingsley. Um, Bill, there you go. So this song, and, and this is like, I feel like this isn't hyperbole, right? And so this is what I was kind of struggling with uh, in the cut little break that didn't just happen that no one heard is like, people will be like, Oh, I read this book and it changed my life. It's like, well, how did, how did it change your life? And I'm sure for some people that's true, but like, I've never read a book that changed my life. I've read books that like I really loved and like informed my thinking on something or inspired, you know what I mean? Like that's, you know, 
Just reading in general for me is that experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> movies. Uh, no movie has literally changed my life. I like, I, I don't know. Like I really fell in love with horror or sci-fi or whatever, but that's not like a life. I don't know. I don't know that I would qualify that as life changing, but I legitimately feel like putting dude ranch in my disc and hearing pathetic for the first time, like actually changed the trajectory of my life in terms of like, wanting to be in a certain type of band and wanting to find certain types of people and ultimately like starting a a website that would get me a job at Exclaim, that would get me a job here, that would get me a job there. Like I can trace all of those decisions to like the way that this song made me feel like a light switch had just like gone off in my head. And so it's so hard to then try to like break it down into its component parts and talk about it in a way that is additive and in a way that is maybe even of value to anyone else. Like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm being totally honest. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Like it just feels like it's impossible to actually do it justice. No, like it's this. Like when when someone says, to, like I'm trying to think of an example. Like someone pays you a compliment and they're like, "Oh, I really love, I really love." Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think. Or like, man, you're you're really cool, man. And you're like, "Oh, thank you so much." And like. No, I mean it. Like, you're, like, really cool. Like, I love you. And it's, like, it becomes, like, uncomfortable. Like, I feel like we're both just hedging to not start gushing and being disgusting about how good this song is. Yeah, I think we've already gushed a lot on this song, and so maybe it's hard. But I think that's sort of maybe at least the thing I wanted to say, because at least sort of frames the, the difficulty that I'm having, or at least, like, my anxiety heading into this. is like, how do you talk about this thing where, like, what are, what are the most, like, important things that happen in your life. I'm like, okay, well, you know, uh, I met my wife. I heard pathetic for the first time. I don't know. <laughs> like, that's it. You, you know, all of those, those things. things. <laughs> well, you know, through, through my wife, I met most of my, like my best friends through pathetic. I met most of my other best friends, like my fucking job. Everything I do is traced back to the like change that started with this song. Right. And I don't know that another yeah. thing would have had that effect. Like, I, I just wonder if I'd bought, like, a fucking Slick Shoes record. <laughs> You'd be a pastor now. Right, yeah. Like, <laughs> what's that version of my life like? Because this is also at a time where there is a streaming. you had streaming. heard pop punk before this, right? No, because this was like, you know, I had heard some Green Day, but I didn't own Dookie at this point because it had come out when I was, like, in the fourth grade and only listened to musicals. So, like... Right. Like, this is, what, this is the interesting thing for me is where... Christian music actually played an integral part because I had already like gotten into MXPX before I heard this. So I like I was like aware of the musical aesthetics. You knew what and, they like, were doing, the mu- kind of. Yeah, I like it made sense to me, but then I was like, oh my god, this is like on another level. Because do MXPX Just, like, the have sheer force of this? That's what I mean. Do MXPX have anything that's like this propulsive and this fast? Oh, yeah, big time. Like, I feel like you, I genuinely think you've never heard MXPX. I've heard I'm, a, I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay. Right. Yeah, you've, you mentioned that one. Um, <laughs> that sounds that's great. A, that's like a centrist anthem now. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> America was already great. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's good, man. No, um, like MXPX and has Chick Magnet. Like, I, it doesn't sound like Chick Magnet. Yeah, Chick Magnet is horrible stain on their legacy. <laughs> yeah. Don't uh, play this for Mike Carrera, who I'm hoping to get on the pod one day. Is, is Chick um, Magnet there like all the small things where it's a mainstream touch point and it's kind of mortifying if you're a true head? I don't know. I think the true heads still like it, which makes it even worse. Mm. Um, but they, because of that song, they've always had like a novelty song on every album and it's just like, get it away. <laughs> like the offspring with California bumping in my trunk where you're like, you're too old for this. No one cares anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. you don't need a novelty song. <laughs> but I'm glad they do. Anyway, I mean, at the time, maybe you did. Yeah. Anyways, speaking of MXPX, actually, um, kind of an interesting thing I found, only tangentially related, but uh, when they played in Australia in 1999, this was when Travis was already in the band, but it was pre-plane accident. So I, I don't know for some reason, Travis didn't make it to. Uh, this Australian show that they did in 99. Huh. But instead, they got, like, a whole bunch of drummers to fill in on every song. So Josh Freeze plays on a couple of songs. And apparently, Yuri from MXPX played on a song, but there's no video of it. So that's kind of a holy grail um, 
video to find one day. Wow. There is footage here of who we've mentioned before as being a very aptly named drummer, Brooks Wackerman. <laughs> um, and what's he from again? Like, Brooks Wackerman was in Bad Religion. Oh yeah, okay. What was he in? Was he in something? He might have been in something else before that, but I unfortunately well, he, just he know also him drummed as... on. He drummed on the Tom DeLonge solo thing that we did exclusively about. Oh yeah, he also he's a former drummer for Bad Religion, Suicidal Tendencies, Infectious Grooves, and Tenacious D. Wow, <laughs> what a what a smorgasbord. Yeah. Of uh. <laughs> Like, if you saw someone's, like, CD collection and it was that stuff, you'd be like, I, I think I forgot I left my uh, pilot light on my <laughs> oven at home and just never. A, you would leave, and B, you would go home and turn your pilot light on and die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. Uh, anyways, but he fucking kills it. Up. So here's him playing Pathetic in Aussie um, in 99. <laughs> sounds really horrible uh, if you're just listening to the podcast. <laughs> but the video is cool. Also, uh, it's no, it sounds great, actually, because like what is it what you were talking about and what I was talking about, the way the song is structured? Why does this song sound like it's being propelled so quickly forward? Even the way he's drumming it sounds like Scott. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just there's almost no other way to to kind of play it. Like, it's just. It's this is a song about the drums, like it's just. It's also the thing that's crazy about this that must have been kind of a trip at the time is this is actually before Brooks Wackerman joined Bad Religion, so this is Blink One Eighty Two with the drummer of Suicidal Tendencies, which is way <laughs> cooler and yeah, funnier. Like if they're cooler. like, thanks to our friend from Suicidal Tendencies, we're like, oh shit, those bad boys. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, <laughs> do you think Suicidal Tendencies is like, uh, you're out of the band? That's probably why he joined Bad Religion shortly thereafter. <laughs> like, you can't be doing this, like, embarrassing pop punk shit, man. We, <laughs> only this incredibly not embarrassing band, <laughs> Suicidal Tendencies. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I've ever even listened to Suicidal Tendencies. I just, they have a good look. They have a good logo. Yeah, Their aesthetic I, makes me think of Beavis and Butthead, and I respect that. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. I mean, like, Mike Muir seems like a cool, fun dude. And, uh, you know, I know the song about Pepsi. And that's about as deep on their catalog as I've gone. That sounds pretty good. They have a song about Pepsi? You know, all I wanted was a Pepsi. Um, so Blink has, two years ago, I don't have any evidence of this, but apparently they were teasing that they were going to add this song back to the set list. Like, I, I think they stopped playing it for many decades. And then they were, but I, I feel like if they did this with Matt Skiba singing the Tom part, I would be out for good. That would probably be the final straw. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I just wonder is like in all of these videos, it's constant punk jumps. Like it's not even punk jumps. It's just like Mark just pogos through the entire song. Like the energy <laughs> of it, again, just sort of carries him upwards to the heavens. And we know now that they are a, a very stationary band. So not only would hearing Skiba do it, I don't know. Here's the thing. If I'd had enough like beers and I'm at the blink show, like I've already, dis I've already accepted a level of madness and they played pathetic. I don't think I would be like, Ew. I'd probably like swan dive into the pit and just kill myself. <laughs> To die a beautiful death. Uh, I love how we were talking about actual moshing earlier and then just imagining the <laughs> pit of, like, Blink-182 in Vegas where it's just, like, a bunch of, like, 40-year-old uh, accountants <laughs> with lanyards. <laughs> It'd be a hell of a lot of lanyards. Do you think we would be... Or, like, those, what's it called when your keys are on, like, a blue ribbon, a long blue ribbon <laughs> that has, like, your favorite sports logo on it? Oh, like, yeah. that's the aesthetic of these people. <laughs> and, like, they're wearing, like, sandals. <laughs> yeah, the pit is all sandals. 
<laughs> it's so Christian. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's a beautiful thing, and I hope to experience it. But they, so they've joked about doing it live again. Like they were like hinting at it, and then I don't know, nothing became of it. I feel like they always do this thing where they're like. We're going to be go- playing some deep cuts. We're going to be going deep into the back catalog. And then they just play like Carousel and then all the other songs that they've always played. I feel like that first, and I, I have not kept up with it. Also, I don't, I, I don't even know, like, are the Vegas shows back on? I think so. So that first weekend. I don't really know much about this band. <laughs> no. That first weekend, though, Mark posted the set list and it was pretty extensive. But Pathetic was not there, as I recall. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's back. Oh, it is. It's going into November now. It's it's back in October and then going till November seventeenth. Sick. See you there, pal. <sighs> <laughs> I was kind of hoping, yeah, uh, kind of hoping we'd get off scot free with this one. Well, and I'll that tell you, pun you, was not intended. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, okay, it's fine. <laughs> I never want to be scot free. Just so you know, there's a lot of covers, but before we get into the covers. Mm-hmm. I wanted to play you this remix that someone made. Hell yeah. And the reason I'm playing it is because it reminds me a lot of a different band. Um, so let's hear it, and then I'll explain it. What I like about it, too, is that this person's username is Pathetic Remixes. <laughs> oh, how many Pathetic Remixes did they make? I think they probably only made one, but they said, if I get five likes, I'll do another remix of any song you like. And there's only one like um, on here. But I guess I could like it. As Blink One Fifty Five, I'll like it as this exists. And then wait, how do you ch- how do you? S- oh, here we go. Switch account, prenup, <laughs> can like it. Yeah. Or does it know? Does it know if you're doing the same? No, I don't think it'll know. And then Josiah Hughes can like it. <laughs> so some real time. Yeah, that's five. YouTube. There likes. we go. Hell yeah. Now he's got five. So I don't know. I mean, you've named your account Pathetic Remixes. So I don't know if you. Although they're calling their own remix pathetic, so I guess that's why. Oh, okay. Um, but so you've gotten five likes, pathetic remixes. So hopefully, what should we ask? Let's do it right now. Let's, what should we ask him to remix? Um, you should ask as this exists. Okay, I'm gonna say, "Hey, pathetic remixes." Um, you got your five likes. Say that. You've got your five likes. It's a bit so, passive aggressive. Uh, oh, sorry. I see this video now as five likes. <laughs> no, I like it the passive aggressive way. It's like uh it's kind of mean. Okay, g- that's true. Okay. It's like alpha. Okay, okay. So now that this video has 5 likes, um I would request you remix <sighs> What's it going to be? Do we want to do something that we've already done or something for like for the future? Or what if it's like not even a blink song? Oh, that's cool. Can you remix How Soon Is Now? Right? <laughs> Perfect. Well, we'll follow up. Um, hopefully, Pathetic Remixes Wait, touches on that. should we get them to remix a Smash Mouth song, and then we can sort of bring it to Smash Mouth as sort of an offering? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, Can do you that. do a remix of Why Can't We Be Friends, the Smash Mouth version? <laughs> right? I figure a little deep, little deep, the, the third people Smash Bros. song. People always, like, people always talk about All-Star, but even, like, Walking on the Sun is such a jam. Walking on the Sun fucking rules. It's so good. All right. I mean, we could talk to Pathetic Remixes all day. <laughs> <laughs> Let's listen to Pathetic Remixes, Pathetic Remix. Okay. Sick. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously we both love it because it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> but the reason that I wanted to play it is because I wish I could remember the actual right song. But it reminds me so much of the band Liturgy, 
who I think is like oh now, yeah they've they've now been forgotten in the era of fake black metal which I have always respected and loved from the beginning but mm-hmm. liturgy was like the greatest they were way more pretentious than death heaven they're way more like academic and just punishing about just talking about black metal and their riffs were sick and they were obscenely bad live <laughs> like truly <Really? laughs> couldn't do it live i saw them uh, at the opera house I mean, sort of around the time when I think people were almost talking about them, and it was a fucking mess. Whereas, like, Def Heaven can do it live. Liturgy cannot do it live. <laughs> well, then, because I always wanted to see them at um, Phil Elvram from Mount Erie, uh, now, now betrothed to the actress Michelle Williams. Um, but he used to have this festival in Anacortes, Washington. And at the festival, it would be, like, all of his all of his friends doing their like quiet folk stuff. And then like liturgy and earth would always play Sick. and wolves in the throne room. And I was like, fuck, I want to go watch liturgy like with Phil Alvarum. But I never went when they played, but then they became like, I don't know. They went on tour with Diplo and then just like, I think they went too far up their own asses too quickly. Whereas deaf heaven has been sort of making it last longer. But anyways, that remix really reminded me of liturgy. Totally. And I think what I love about hipster black metal is that it secretly sounds like blink. <laughs> it's true. Like now I'm realizing like, why did I like liturgy besides the fact that I like love hipster black metal? And it's, it's actually so much worse than just, you know, listening to things that other people tell me are cool. It's actually because I only like the things that I liked when I was 13. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, but the, right, before we move on, um, just cause I feel like I want to either warn you or see if maybe I'm I'm th- curious if like th- this is kind of like a funeral or like a wedding like I feel like you just keep wanting to interject with maybe incredibly sincere things One more, no it's just I, I think you mispronounced a word there <laughs> and um, uh oh what did I, I say I think you, you said like his betrothed or something what, oh yeah I, believe, I don't know how to say that I shit. believe it's betrothed although I saw a meme <laughs> recently that was like don't make fun of someone when they mispronounce a word it means they learned it from reading and so I just want to say <laughs> it's also not true for me <laughs> I mean I, <laughs> I learn words through osmosis I guess I never <laughs> talk to anyone or read anything <laughs> right. so I don't really know how I know any words it's sort of a you're a miracle baby <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for covers? Dude, I'm so ready. I'm like a little worried, but... Let's play the uh, cover theme song, and then we'll get into it. Okay, sick. Okay, heard it. (laughs) (laughs) I was thinking that when I was listening to other podcasts, like they have like songs for all of their segments, and we don't have anything. Do you want to like start having high production values? No, I don't want to at all. I still hold my mic. Like it's the olden days. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Never don't forget the struggle. Don't forget the streets. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we All could right, have well, oh, but you know what though? Because I have enjoyed the uh, um, it's sort of a bummer for this to be the first episode in a couple of weeks that doesn't have a premiere of a free punk lyrics.tumblr.com. Yeah, that's pretty disappointing actually. <laughs> yeah. Um but maybe we could These uh, people don't do enough for us. <laughs> it's true. I'm I'm frankly I'm disappointed by the lackadaisical listeners of this podcast. Maybe uh, free you pronounce that wrong. Sorry. <laughs> look look, look at that. Like a digical. Like a, like a digital. Um, <laughs> listeners, maybe free punk lyrics could write a song about covers. People could, you know, record a version of that. You know, we could really just become like a content Ouroboros. The beautiful thing about free punk lyrics is that I don't have access to Tumblr anymore, so I can't even add more if I wanted to. Like, I would love, now that I know people are going to get tricked into acting at my every whim i would love to maybe write a free punk lyric song that like just makes fun of you and then have someone record it <laughs> right but i can't even access my tumblr anymore so are you banned it's, from it's tumblr like, or you just forgot your password i think i forgot my password but then my shaw email address that i used for like 20 years got so deeply hacked that i just <laughs> asked them to delete the account altogether Forgetting that, like, every single thing on the internet is connected to my Shaw account. So, right. I, I don't know. What an interesting anecdote. Hell yeah, man. That's the kind of thing that uh, keeps people supporting us via Patreon.com. Yeah, Patreon.com slash Blink155. Put your money in there. <laughs> it's like a bank, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's a great place. Uh, solid investment. Uh, it's going to go over the years. And in 10 years, you're going to get all your money back plus interest. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and that's the pro- the Blink One Fifty Five <laughs> guarantee. That's a pod promise. Uh, so this first one is seems to be the most popular cover of the song, and I haven't even listened to it yet. Um, this is a popular just, song, right? Yeah, like we, we're, you're in for quite a ride. I hope that you're strapped in right now. Hell yeah! I hope we didn't have any plans for the next couple of days. It's <laughs> gonna be a while. Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm ready. I've got an adult um, diaper on. That's it. That's perfect. all I have on. <laughs> I just wear regular diapers, like children's diapers. <laughs> Sick. I'm not exactly well endowed, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, like, um, I like the idea in that scenario is that the only difference between the <laughs> size of an adult diaper and a child's diaper is the area the for your area. dick. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know that baby asses are the same as adult asses. It's true, but they have tiny dicks. It's just dicks. the dick that changes. <laughs> <laughs> we grow into our asses. <laughs> exactly. Uh, eventually, you get a dick to match your gigantic human adult ass. <laughs> <laughs> a baby. Now that's a Photoshop. I'd like to see a baby with a hu- with a male ass. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Okay. So this this band is called Act As If. What a what a name. What an evocative name. Hell um, yeah. They've covered Pathetic by Blink-182. The first comment is, this hasn't earned half the credit it should have. Love the cover. So let's see if, if we also uh, love it. speech impediment i think he's developed one by trying to sound like chris martin he's like, he he is actually singing in the musical he is the musical uh syntax equivalent of a baby with a human male ass <laughs> <laughs> he's doing this like oh god it's really like the I've spoken before about how it's bad to say the R word about things, but sometimes people actually sound like they're trying, like it sounds like they're being ableist when they do these uh, (laughs) voices. It's like, it's crazy. There's no way that guy actually talks like that. He's like, I'll have a macchiato, please. (laughs) Like ordering a coffee. Like he sounds like he's dying while he sings. Well, and, and here's the most questionable thing is this band, this, this man band is from Los Angeles. So, again, it feels like it's a speech impediment that he's developed sort of by trying to sort of like like he's he's saying yellow a lot at karaoke. And then was like, okay, I've kind of got the mouth sounds. I'm just going to take that and translate it into other songs now, which is it's sort of a shame because I I, like being a massive corn dog. Like if that was just like a straight up death cab postal service version of that song and you had sweet baby Ben's, uh, you know, croon over top of that i would fucking love it and instead i'm like i love it but i'm not gonna cuss <laughs> oh so you only just kind of love it well just like is it still a it's still an enchanting melody i just hate how everyone ha- like every single struggle pop singer sings with this like they don't have enough oxygen going to their brain <laughs> voice yeah like, it's like it's like part pixie and part like I don't even know drug addict or something like they just sound insane. And it's, it's, this is the, what I think when we look back at this generation of the 2010s music, this is what people are going to point single out and make fun of is like minimal aesthetic coffee shops and people who (laughs) sing like they're a toddler. Well, I think it's, it's, it's an attempt to put some character into your voice. Like if you have a, if you have a good singing voice, but no character, which is, I mean, I think really what most 
people kind of have, like a functional singing voice if you can carry a melody. In the same way that, like, in punk, you would sort of gruff up your voice in a way that is an, an affectation. This is just like the indie rock equivalent of, you know, fest voice, where you're just right. trying to create charisma where there maybe is none. Not to mention that using that parallel, like being a struggle punk band that accomplishes nothing is still really fun. And you get to like make your amp really loud and and do punk jumps or like drink in a van somewhere or have adventures. But I can't imagine being like this band doesn't even have that many followers on Twitter. They're not even like they're just sort of like a band. And I can't imagine what the appeal is of doing this like hyper earnest baby voice music if you're not like doing sweet punk jumps and turning your amp up loud. Yeah. If you're also not like being able to like get in the van and go drink in a basement in some weird town, like th- I, I, I totally get it. Like what is, those are the only parts that make being in an unsuccessful, like these, uh, these kind of bands, I just think of like industry showcases and stuff like that. That just seems like hell on earth. Well, yeah, this is like a very, you know, slickly produced black and white video. There's a couple of different sets. I mean, it's very sincere. And it has 81,000 views. Like, it's good, but it's not, you know... Like, I've, I've said this bef- before, you know, when we've talked about being in bands, I'm so grateful to have had the experience of, like, playing in a touring punk band. And it doesn't matter that it didn't, like, work out because all of those terrible and stupid experiences that you mentioned are, like, kind of unique to that opportunity, right? Whereas this, like, is all the stuff that sucks about being in a band. Like, this is probably yeah. all you're doing is, like, posting online and... The only option is to get really famous or yeah. be depressed. Yeah, Whereas there's no if you're in a rewarding... punk band, like, it's just, like, remember when we were on tour and it was my birthday and we were, like, this is a true story. We were on the pier in San Francisco and everything was closed because it was, like, a Sunday and we shared... Um, some Jack Daniels with like a homeless guy that offered it to us. And then somehow (laughs) because of that, our friend Keaton who was on tour with us got like insanely sick for four days, like from that moment (laughs) on. And he was like, he looked like a cartoon sick person. Like he was so pale and shivering and wearing blankets all the time in the back of the vehicle. (laughs) It was like (laughs) things like that. Like just like the most insane sketchy stories that you would obviously never have otherwise. Yeah, totally. Instead of just like, Again, this is just, I'm thinking of lanyards again. Well, and especially, and I also think sort of what you're pointing out is especially for um, people that come from, you know, like relatively privileged backgrounds, it is your chance to like, like have genuine experiences that maybe make you a bit of a character in common people or something. But like, you know, that you are, you wouldn't sleep on a floor at home because like, you know, you've got like uh, a, a stable home And, you know, even if everything bottoms out in your actual life, you can literally, like, go and sleep on your parents' couch or in their guest room or something. But this idea of, like, I'm going to spend two weeks eating dirt and sleeping on basement floors (laughs) after the show is, like, really an incredible experience that you don't otherwise get. I don't know. I'm fumbling my way through this. I'm just too – I'm raw now. I just don't get it. I just don't understand. And everyone loves this cover, so God bless you. Congrats, (laughs) everyone. I'm just going to sit over here and be angry. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> but I think I'll pe- feel happy if we go into the the th- stream of three terrible acoustic videos that I've written down. That'll, that'll cheer me up. Oh, yeah. That sounds like um, the exact kind of thing that you love to do. So this is a band called Inside Riot, which I don't really understand uh, what uh, that Yeah, this band means. is from, I think, Montreal. Like I feel like we've played with them. Yeah, I think there's a lot of Sam stuff coming up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is on a radio station, and it is all in French, so it must be in Montreal. Is it? Yeah. This is like a la Radio Sun, Vendredi, gotta be Montreal. Okay, well, this is Inside Riot in 2013, performing live on the radio. No one with that 
<laughs> it's funny that I was just making fun of the uh, child voice affectation when clearly pop punk is the most affected vocals of them all. Yeah, like that was a, a good sort of lead into this just like. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I'm like pretty sure I have a lot of um, friends in common with this band. <laughs> so you don't want to. <laughs> so I mean, I'm you know. So you loved it. I, I just I was like, it was cool, man. It was cool to hear. Neat that you did it. <laughs> like that song a lot. <laughs> I don't know that. Like I thought it was kind of cool how actually sincerely how they rearranged the guitar. Like I was frustrated by it at first, but then I was like, well, at least they didn't just straight up play. Like, they've sort of moved the notes around a little bit. Yeah, it was just, the tra- so that it was unique. The transition out of the intro into the part where they sang was, like, weirdly... Because I guess all of that is, again, like, led by drums. So it's phenomenally inelegant to hear it done as an acoustic song. It's just like, what... what, what how are these things getting mashed together? It was very, very <laughs> odd. Uh, uh, well, this guy will move away from your friends, and eventually we'll get to more They're of not friends, my I friends. Think. Well, they are your friends. I can tell. These guys are your best friends. I don't think I've met. I'm good looking this up. I'm going to see if we played together. I don't think we played together. These guys are your best friends. These guys, oh, Dal Failure. No, no, the yeah, the yeah, the, let's just move on. Dal Failure is the next guy. Um, this was published just late last year, and <laughs> this video is. <laughs> he's like, first of all, he looks like some sort of like. <sighs> Like, those last guys were kind of, like, my understanding of, like, defend pop punk people, maybe. Right. Yeah, totally. This guy is more of the, like, somehow you also dress like Tommy Lee at the same time as being pop punk. Oh, yeah. I think this is, like, a definitely particular to kind of contemporary L.A., though. Yeah, Or, maybe. like, yeah, aspiring like... to being from L.A. <laughs> yeah, like, constantly telling people you're about to move to L.A. Yeah, like, look. you have in your Instagram bio, like, you know... Uh, Poughkeepsie and then the little train logo or like the little plane logo at LA. Uh, well, his name is Dal Failure. So um, perhaps he's he's already aware of this. But so what he's done is he's driving his car and he has a GoPro while he drives and he's doing the call and response vocals so that like the top one is one voice and the bottom one is another voice. It's really clever. It's super so let's clever. Listen to it. Just imagine, imagine a guy who um, buys the most punk-looking things at Sunglasses Hut, and that's what he looks like while he sings. <laughs> Uh, interestingly enough, he's actually from Newcastle, New South Wales, which is Ooh. in Australia. So well, there you go. So that's uh, probably the, what it, we're describing, wearing like terrible spy sunglasses in 2017 in Australia. They're like, oh, that guy's like fucking he's basically our version of like uh, <laughs> trying to think of someone really cool and i can't think of someone cool right now that, that's the problem is we've gone so far we don't know what's cool anymore <laughs> i'm so lost <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i hated that I'm, i it turns out that this cover section is not um i mean it's affirming that i love the song but it's also reminding me that a lot of blink songs like ones we don't like often this is the sort of part where you're like oh but that melody is actually really interesting yeah and the melody I know, and then it's dangerous when it's a good song and i think it what it does for me is it helps me real it helps me understand why cool people hate blink 182 <laughs> right yeah because really. you're like oh okay yeah i guess if it comes across like this or like if these people are into it yeah it explains why you're turned off by it. i mean it's sort of a bit of a context clue you could say about <laughs> right yeah um, yeah, it's, it's a reminder that like, while functionally the melody is amazing, we were, I think, right to say that this is like a very drum centric drum led song and that 
I mean, I feel like I said the word propulsive a dozen times this episode. And yeah. while these have the lyrics and the melody that I love, there's such a like key component of what brings it all together that's missing that I'm bumming quite quite badly, actually. Well, the other problem is that like something about this song has really not inspired most people to do anything with it. So that's either acoustic or just a straightforward, boring pop punk cover. Right. So like, it's just kind of, maybe it's when there's something missing from the song is when people try to actually like do something interesting with it. But with when a song like this is so iconic and good, people are just like, I just don't get what would make you think like, Hey, I have a really great idea. I'm going to go on SoundCloud and upload myself singing this Blink-182 song acoustically. You know, like, don't you ever check to see? It's kind of like, you know, how we check to make sure there weren't other Blink-182 <laughs> Yeah, there are any other No, good. We're adding something new to the world. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, I can't understand what's wrong with those people. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this um, Pacific Ridge Records tribute to Blink-182 compilation series, I guess, because this is number two mm-hmm. uh, in the series. And this has had, like, all-time low and all these bands that I f- don't care about. Um, but this entry for the cover of Pathetic was by a band called Great Glass Elevator. Is that a thing that you know? No. You? Nope. Um, but let's <laughs> hear it. me like it sounds like a country ballad and it sounds a lot like worship music like big time. right and that's what happened when when emo started getting really really slick and overproduced i was like this just sounds like church music i can't listen to this i already don't want to listen to church music <laughs> right and these people are clearly going to hell so i don't want to listen to this <laughs> I, I feel like if I went to, like, a country bar or, you know, there's always, like, a, a, a live country band playing at this sick country bar at the CNE, um, which is a great end-of-summer fair that happens in Toronto that I can't go to now because they locked out their union. Can't go see Moist play. I'm really mad about it. We'll do a separate pod. <laughs> Being denied my shit. But, um... This the, periodically they'll do like the, it'll be like a new country act and they're like they got tattoos and they're doing it kind of they're covering a song you know like I can see this song coming on and me losing my mind in that context but not in that context it didn't really yeah it didn't really sound country to me but it, it did make me realize that the self deprecating lyrics work because the song is so badass and fast and cool. But then as soon as you make it none of those things, right. then the self-deprecating lyrics are extremely depressing. <laughs> right. I feel like at least the, the chorus, though, it opens up in a very new country way, like in the, in the harmonies and stuff. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm going to hit play a, a little bit more. because. <laughs> yeah, those those. Again, what you're hearing as new country is what I'm hearing as uh, church worship <laughs> Yeah, music. To- I can totally... Now that you've said it, thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's just church music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Either way, uh, what a reprehensible cover. <laughs> yes. D- didn't care for that. And so is that band like a punk band? I have no idea. I mean, what kind of... Great Glass Elevator is definitely the name of like a fake band from a movie that where you'd be like, there's no bands called that. <laughs> right, yeah. And they play that cover and you're like, well... <laughs> um, no, I don't know. Uh, like psychedelic a, rock. I know that can't be the same one. Oh, they have a a one out of ten review on Punk News from two thousand five. Wow, <laughs> this is really good. 
Five kids from so. Orange County are having emotional troubles over their boring attempts to sound like a drive through band and Phantom Planet. <laughs> <laughs> this shit makes me want to puke. It has no relevance in the world of music. Oh, wow. man. Okay, cool. Remember so, when people used to write like this? <laughs> yeah, just savage shit. Music like, writing used to be so good. Oh, I know. so good. Now everyone's... There's like two you know, music journalists and they're all friends with all the bands. No one can say anything. Yeah. You're talking about me and my friendship with Smash Mouth. I'm talking about how I accept that criticism. (laughs) Yeah. When will I, I I want, uh, what is it? Ethics and Smash Mouth journalism. (laughs) 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 Ha (laughs) ha. Sorry. (sighs) Oh no. Oh, this one's not on here. What the fuck? Thank God. Hang on. So I just Hang reacted on. to you sending me a link called the punk rock hillbilly dot bandcamp dot com. And mercifully, when you click on it, the link is dead. So one down because I don't I don't want to <laughs> know. And I found it on YouTube. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> Does this seriously nothing happen in this song? You know what that sounds like, like the, though, and I'm now realizing is like this is the same melody in the Chicks Ticket song "Welcome to the Daiso" from Pink Razors. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> like, and he kind of sounds like KJ a little bit. Like if KJ sucked, that's what <laughs> KJ would sound like. <laughs> like this, yeah, I can hear that a bit. I'm just gonna see if anything happens in this. <laughs> So they've done, they, luckily some bluegrass elements finally come in, but the way that they've made it sort of this build up, they've taken the one charming thing potentially about themselves, which is that they're doing a hillbilly vibe and instead they've turned it into a Mumford vibe. Yeah. Also they're from Sydney. So <laughs> <laughs> like what is like, just like Maddie, come get your people, man. Like, <laughs> The, the, the yeah, why is Wadonga so cool <laughs> compared to <laughs> the the like dumb accents and stuff? Like I I can fuck with like a bluegrass tribute. In fact, only last week I listened to on like multiple times throughout the week the bluegrass tribute to the Offspring, and they're like proper like fast fun bluegrass versions of the Offspring songs that we all know and love. So. <laughs> You know, I'd be interested in that, like a full force, like, you know, because bluegrass can have that like out of control speed to it. But this like, yeah, Mumford ass shit is a drag. I don't know. I mean, I also feel like I'm just about ready to admit that I like Mumford and Sons. I oh, feel like I'm you're there about on schedule to <laughs> convince myself that they're good. I can't wait till like you insult Mar- Marcus Mumford on Twitter and he ends up on the pod. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of actually... uh He's big time from the Vineyard Church in London. He was like, that band started as a Christian worship team in church. So. <laughs> I'm not surprised. So did you have like... There's a- all kinds of things. I probably have like an in. I feel like through my parents, I could probably find someone. <laughs> but I don't know if they would... <laughs> I don't know if I could use that connection to get him on the pod. Oh, come on. What good are <laughs> parents try. if not uh, for getting Mumford's <laughs> on your Blake 182 podcast? Look, there's people I've asked to be on the pod that I haven't mentioned on here yet that you know about. I know. I clearly have no shame. Yeah, you are leveraging I'm some family connects at a very high level. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like this vibe that we're on. Right, I'm just reshuffling things because I like how I'm just seeing how much I can make you hate the song. <laughs> right. And so this is a really good I mean, it's never going to work. Like, you can't. You can make me hate these covers. But holy shit, how many of these do you fucking have? 
a lot. <laughs> this one is a. Uh, this guy's wearing a ringer tee that ha- says has the Goonies logo, but it, instead it says the ukuleles. Mm, um, that's so this is uploaded by the Sebi next door in 2012. And he's making a lot of uke face. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh. I know I'm pathetic and you when she said it I lose her up once when she called me when I drove her There's no more waiting and you're no more wasting I've done all I can but she still wants to be left alone. You got, you got, you got to help me out I wish people could see the faces that this fucking uke man is making. Like, they're... <laughs> they're uh, it's true. It's unreal. Like, it looks like uh, it's Sasha Baron Cohen doing a bit where he is a ukulele YouTuber. Like, it's the only yeah. way I could describe it is it's it's beyond parody. It's, like, kind of hard to describe these people without sounding alt-right. Which is why I'm just not <laughs> describing them. Because I don't want to like engage in that, but it's very much like, where have we gone wrong as as human beings? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, let's let's save this for our like debut on the Rebel Podcast Network. <laughs> yeah, but the dude who is was that other guy playing a mandolin? Because I think mandolin is actually twenty times worse than uke. No, because in terms of awful instruments, mandolin like you got to do the work, whereas you can get a ukulele probably at. Uh, under uh, underground outfitters, what's this, what's it called? Urban outfitters. <laughs> <laughs> you seriously don't know what urban? No, outfitters I knew. Is I, do, I promise you, I know. Like I'm not, I'm not better than urban outfitters, but it just the name <laughs> escaped like, me. Wow. Um, <laughs> what is this uh, shopping place <laughs> oh, where people so go to? Inter- uh, I'm just not interested in uh, fashion. I'm much more interested <laughs> in intellectual pursuits. Yeah, uh, the written word. Why don't they go to the library. <laughs> yeah, the library is my mall. Um, Actually, Urban Outfitters is my library. I love <laughs> books about like cheeseburgers or whatever the fuck. <laughs> so good. I always get all that shit for like two dollars. I'm like, see, I have, I own books. It's all like <laughs> it's all it's tumblers, all, like, single purpose tumblers that have turned yeah. into like children's books. Yeah. <laughs> uh, What's wrong with that? No, dude, it's so good. Um, <laughs> anyway, this is this is that. This is extremely that. Oh. Yeah, I don't hate the song, yeah. but I do hate um, Swiss ukulele YouTubers now. <laughs> That's not a huge well, change. Speaking, <laughs> speaking of uh, alt-right rhetoric, I genuinely thought that this was Sam Hyde for a second, which is why I clicked it. But it's not. It's just a guy who kind of looks like Sam Hyde. Um, I wish Sam Hyde had some very sincere covers of Pathetic just floating around YouTube from... You know, 10 years ago or something. <laughs> I w- me too, because I briefly fell for the thing that, like, he was actually a double agent and was, like, just on, like, the next, next, next level of irony. I think a lot of people um, did. But it's clearly not. No one is capable of that. I mean, trust me, I've tried. It's not possible to be on that level of irony. <laughs> no. He, There's no way. He's not that he's, ironic. No, he's no actually he just, just sucks. sucks. <laughs> Um, and so does this person who looks like Sam Hyde. So this is uh, by Quit Karen from 2016. Um, and here we go. So what do you want me to do? I just sit here and play. Just play all these songs. Play everything myself. You have a magic power or something? play all the parts. That's what everybody's doing. Why can't we do something different? It's so boring. Fine. Fine. I'll, I'll play it.
I know I'm pathetic, I knew when she said it A loser, a bum, that's what she called me when I drove her Now there's no more waiting and sure no more wasting I've done all I can but she still wants to Oh my, okay, so when I Holy wrote this down shit. earlier I had only skipped ahead to the singing part But there's a, there's a skit <laughs> Oh my god so there's a sp- <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things where I almost feel guilty watching it because it's I, so. <laughs> oh, I just have like full body chills, man. So it opened with some sort of spoken word thing about whether or not he should play the song. And oh, this dude is like our age. Part, I want to make this really clear. Like if if he's younger than us, it's not by enough. Like yeah. this. Yeah. This is a grown ass <laughs> man. With a, a Blink-182 bunny tattoo and I think like a fucking Disney tattoo on his hand, maybe. Oh, well, actually, he has the URL, thepoppunkdad.com. Um, so this is quite a... Oh, there's a full-on blog called The Pop Punk Dad. And that's and he is the, the titular He's dad? the pop punk dad, yeah. Um, this changes everything. What the fuck? Oh, he has... it. Wait, okay, hang on. I need to see this. For okay, you take a look. I'm going to kind of describe this. So he's like in this weird frame, the entire, the, the spoken portion where he's debating with seemingly like a voice in his head about whether or not he should make like a typical YouTube you, play and all the instruments himself video. So he's framed like really weirdly, like it's only his midsection. You can't really see his eyes. You can just sort of see his mouth moving. And then there is like a, a cut in inset of him making like he's going to sing the vocal, like going in with headphones on in front of a, a pop filter. But then he's got tape over his mouth. Like he's being silenced by himself. <laughs> but then even better yet later on, he holds up like, a little handheld kind of Disney princess mirror and looks at himself <laughs> while he's deciding right. if he should sing or not. So is he joking? But there's like a really gauzy photo of him getting into the booth and putting on the headphones. Like he's about to start recording. <laughs> so periodically it seems like he's kidding, but this is a bit of like, this is sort of like my Mac and cheese joke, right? Where like, maybe he was trying to be funny, but instead it just came off like, achingly sincere and I feel really bad for him. I can't tell if it's funny or not either, but like, here's why I think it's okay to be honest because the pop punk dad is also a YouTuber, of course. Yes. Um, and he has, and now I've lost it, but he has somewhere on his channel. He actually reviews, uh, pop punk covers on YouTube. So he sort of is, he's also, uh, although he only, he only talks about the sickest pop punk YouTube cover song. So maybe he doesn't maybe he doesn't talk about the ones that suck, but <laughs> at least he's engaging in the dialogue. Therefore, I think it's fair enough for us to be able to say that that was insanely uncomfortable and bad. Oh, my God. Yeah. He has an interview with Real Big Fish from like a few weeks ago. The pop punk dad is active. He's active. But when, and but this is from two years ago. I mean, I don't hang on. <sighs> Oh fuck! So on on the on the pathetic cover, it says, "Are you curious what the conversation was at the beginning? Find out here." And then you click the link, and it says, "Video unavailable." Oh no! We got to get him on the pod. I I need to understand. Who's Karen, and why must he quit her? I don't know. This man is a father. <laughs> <laughs> the poppunkdad dot com. Uh, yeah, this man is uh, everything, really. He, uh, his he's other really- videos are like set in his bedroom, and you guys would be best friends because he's got so <laughs> many Funko Pops. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, you guys could talk about how much you love to collect toys. <laughs> oh, I need to get rid of everything. I'm looking at his <laughs> merch now. He sells a shirt that says 50 Shades of Green Day. Okay. Should we. Oh, and Taking Back <gasps> Sunday with an ice cream sundae. Well, Josiah, like. I think it's unfortunate that the timing of this episode, because we're recording it before, but after, uh, when the episode is released, we will be just a few days late for your birthday. And so if, I know. if someone who like wanted to buy you a gift were to purchase you the pop punk dad's 50 <laughs> shades of green day shirt for your birthday, <laughs> I just think that would, I mean, look, I'll take anything. And I did re actually, I should mention on the pod, uh, some of our, our Sacramento uh, representatives 
mailed me an insane care package. It was of, like truly sick. It's I can't wait to dig into it and learn. I I I think it really proves that smaller cities or like the less famous cities often have better bands. Maybe you know, like because we always talk about bands not realizing they're from Sacramento, and then that's why these guys got obsessed with us. Well, I think that like um, I mean, and um, this is like. I swear to God, I'm, I was trying to find a way to do this without sort of doing this, but like this ended up being, but I'm just, this is the, my way into the story. So I apologize. But the basically defining part of the book that I ended up writing about the Canadian punk scene, like the, the sort of first wave of Canadian punk. The, oh, here we go. But yeah, kidding. no, I know. But the entire thesis was that like, and what so many bands said, you know, that we talked to um, was that if you were in New York, if you were in L.A., obviously there was, like, no one saying that there wasn't, like, most of the truly great and lasting, you know, music of the, I don't know, the history of popular music has emerged from these sort of, like, major markets because of, you know, the businesses there, but also the creative communities that are fostered and yada, yada, yada. But that, like, being a band from outside of those regions allows you to experiment in a way that you can't if you're in New York because it's just a completely sort of different way of interacting with a music community and interacting with the business of being in a band. And so you could only ever get, you know, SNFU could only come from Edmonton and DOA could only come from Vancouver and, you know, Teenage Head could only come from Hamilton. But it's it's true of all these bands. It's true of like, you know, Devo could only come from Akron. Like there's, an, you take sort of the particulars of that region and, and put really creative people in there and they won't always find each other. And it might not be an entire scene that spawns like dozens of influential bands, but that's where you get these, like, I think truly innovative left turns is in smaller communities where just like weirder shit can develop kind of away from the prying eyes of industry or just like judgy other bands. Yeah. Or just maybe even not like if you grow up in one of those, big cities then you're just surrounded by cool things all the time so you don't have to make your own fun totally yeah um anyways uh, buy sam's book uh we'll do a little amazon <laughs> promo code or whatever <laughs> fuck off <laughs> no don't buy it on amazon actually yeah don't don't buy it from amazon um don't just like focus your energy if you've got money for a book just come to the blink 150 live show spend your money on a on a plane ticket <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to play, I think, only two more because I don't think we're really going to top that man looking at a mirror <laughs> and taping over his mouth. No. That was kind of the greatest thing I've seen in a minute. It was really um, nice. So this band is called, there's like tons of, and this is another reason why I like get sad about the song, but there's tons of these defend pop punk ass people um, like loving this song. And this band is called TIE Fighter, which is part of the pop punk star wars continuum um i don't know do you know this band have you heard of this band i I, think it was like on alternative press and stuff yeah i definitely know the band name and i'm sure i've like listened to it there's this whole like like this sort of pop punk thing like i already know how this is going to sound it's like on the verge of being a thing that i feel like i should like and then i really don't (laughs) so that's that's my sort of relationship with this band and every band that sounds like it is always that i like put on one record to just be like, maybe this can be a guilty pleasure or something. And then I'm like, I don't even, there's, I'm not even being pleasured right now. (laughs) Um, uh, Quote that please. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. So I skipped ahead to the money shot, so to speak of this cover. So we'll hear from, from the juiciest part. Here we go. God fucking damn. <laughs> you know, uh, 
a lot of these things are all making me think like I should have given up on all of these topics <laughs> like 15 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I feel like people talk about this, you know, in relation to any, any sort of pop culture thing, like a movie, um, you know, even a particular sort of speaker or writer or something. And, and at some point, if you look around and everyone who's into a thing is an asshole, like maybe, maybe you're an <laughs> asshole. Maybe that thing is actually bad. <laughs> and just to be sort of faced with uh, an, this just like overwhelming sense that all of these people probably would describe the song in the exact same terms that I have now been describing it for two plus <laughs> hours. Yeah, I know. Like think, I'm sure they'd be uh, like it was like a light switch going off in my heart. I hate to be I hate to be, <laughs> I hate to be the optimist of us too because I feel like that means we're in a bad place. <laughs> um, yeah, but perhaps the issue is that there's a half of this conversation that's been missing from online for all this time, and that there are very cool people who also love this song, and there are people who are like genuinely love Blink-182 but just haven't expressed it for the last 10 years who aren't like people who still live in their parents' house and are in their 30s and like spend their weekends taking photographs of all the different colorways they have of uh, Twisted Tongues LPs or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it feels like. So are you Right now I just feel like it's like people who wear basketball shorts all day, every day. And I'm realizing that I am describing myself as I say that too. <laughs> and so, yes, this is kind of a dark night of the soul. But are you implying that we are the necessary other half of the conversation? No, like, not at all. <laughs> like I'm we've saying come in to sort of save the discourse? No, but I'm hoping that we're kind of a catalyst for that. Um, because obviously, you know, like, like Cousins Dangerous or whatever. Like we've met. Yeah, totally. We've, we've discovered people who are we found the connection to the underground that I think is genuinely cool. There is like a gateway, but it just hasn't really been expressed with some of these songs properly. You know what? I, I actually, I totally agree. And I think that I know we have one other cover, but I'm just going to bridge a little bit into the next 10 minutes, which is that's why we were so excited when we found Colleen Green's covers. Uh, so she was featured on the sometimes episode on the m ms episode. And like, she is, I think representative of that approach where it's like, Oh, this like weird sort of like dirgy, like minimalist stoner pop take on these songs that we love in the same way that, yeah, like Le Cousin Dangereux, the tape of which is sitting right in front of me right now is like, Oh, these are the people that got it right. Where you can, it's not that these songs are uncoverable or like not worthy of, a sort of reimagining or reinterpretation. It's just that like these remarkable, like these are just like basic versions, either like I'm going to slow it down or like I'm going to scream and, and really make the breakdown <laughs> a breakdown. Um, like seemingly for me, like actually entirely missed the point of what is great about the song. And it's so funny. I had thought like when I was going back and forth with Colleen, about having her on this episode. And she had said, you know, pathetic was one of her favorite songs. And I was going to like in the response, be like, yo, you should cover it though. And then I was like, I'm not going to say that because also like, that's just not telling someone else how to do their fucking job. And now I'm realizing <laughs> like, maybe that's it. Like she probably gets it like that. This is what it's, this is what happens. And maybe there's some things that, I don't know, you leave until you actually have a better idea. Yeah. It's kind of like a, I've thought about this before, how, like, um, we talk about band. I think I'm actually quoting myself from my review of The Offspring Show <laughs> in, a, in a casino that I went to. If I can ago, quote but. from the great writer <laughs> Josiah Hughes. Yeah. Well, look, we're both, we're, let's be honest, we're both indulging ourselves quite a bit this episode. I mean um, this episode. <laughs> <laughs> For the first time, yeah. Look, it's been sixty weeks. I think we it's time that we yeah open up a little bit about our own experiences <laughs> and perspectives. <laughs> but at that show specifically, I was thinking a lot about how we talk about these bands as being gateway bands, and how theoretically they're a gateway into a whole other world. But some people just kind of seem to hang out at the gate <laughs> and never cross through it, you know. And that's kind of what I think we're talking about here. Well, it's literally like people talk about you know. Uh, all of these things are like 
content, quite literally, the way that like things get marketed to you is it's a funnel, right? And so not everyone goes down the funnel. Not everyone who sees the trailer for Lady Bird, a great Sacramento film, will watch Lady Bird when it's in the theaters. You might be like me and wait like two years, finally watch Lady Bird and be like, Lady Bird's so good. And th- you know what's really funny about that, actually, very quickly, the same thing that happens whenever you live in one of these non big cities is that as soon as there's a little bit of notice of something, then it becomes totally corny and embarrassing. And I guess when the Oscar campaign happened, Lady Bird was on the cover of every single local paper and they made a mural to Lady Bird and everyone who lived there was like, really? I mean, the movie's fine. The movie is okay. <laughs> yeah, I definitely like watched it late last night and immediately messaged, you know, Blink-155 loves Sack on Twitter. <laughs> every time Sacramento comes up now, I'm like, I have to message this account. Well, we'll have to do a Sacramento season exclusive when we find the right angle. It's not quite time yet, but one day. Yeah, no, it's it's true. We're not we're not there. The, the massive care package wasn't enough, I guess. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I need a couple more. But you know, like the thing I, I love about that, and 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 I think this is sort of gets to the heart of what we're talking about. Where on one hand, all of these pieces make me think that maybe I'm full of shit, and then on the other hand, we have these elements like, you know. Cushion Stage Row, Colleen Green's covers, getting a care package of local bands from Sacramento because one of the elements that we sort of constantly dredge up, especially when we're talking about older Blink, is, oh, this song would have been like the sickest, even the bad old songs, where you're like, this would have been the sickest song from like your local band. Like they have that sound. And something that I think we sort of constantly return to is the energy that those kind of, that, that exists in those, in those memories, I mean, and it certainly, I think, like, actually existed because we were, you know, 15 and actually possessed some some real energy. And that it's so interesting to, like, find people, even through the process of doing this podcast, who sort of have that same enthusiasm where it's like those people get it. Like, you know what I mean? Someone sending you yeah. a care package it's, of, like, punk tapes from Sacramento gets it. Like, this song With, like, notes that, that were like, here's why, here's why I think you'd like this one. Here's why I exactly, think you'd like this yeah. one. Exactly, yeah. It's like... Whereas I think a lot of these other people that are coming up that we get annoyed by is like in their And it's just obviously, obviously, like I've said before, millions of times, there's I don't think that there's such a thing as like actual good music and actual bad music. It's all like subjective. You're just a drill but, tweet, right? There's actually zero things between good things and bad things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you fucking exactly. imbecile. <laughs> That's actually true. Um, but like, I think it's just like some left brain, right brain kind of shit. But I think that a lot of these people hear these old Dude Ranch songs and think, you know what? This needs some production value or something. And yeah. Then they, just, <laughs> then they just kind of ruin it. Like the whole point is that it sounds kind of shitty or like it's falling apart. That's why we like it. Well, so. And that's why this song, I think, and, and why Dude Ranch in general sort of sits in such a perfect area because it has a rawness to it that appeals to snobs like us. Not that liking Dude Ranch is a remotely snobby thing, because like this is a massive and popular pop album. Yeah. But it's still it doesn't have the sheen that kind of comes later. And then to add that sheen to it just sort of destroys the spirit. Exactly. And so <laughs> we've talked a lot about like house shows and stuff. And what was the name what was the name of your website that you used to have? Uh juicebox.com.com. Right. And there was like you would have bands, bands play at your house and stuff. Right. Yeah. So, um, I, I, now I think I feel like I have a feeling I know where this is going. Um, so juice box manor was the home that, uh, myself and wife of the pod, Ashley moved into as our first house and it was in the annex area of Toronto. And so uh, we had a, a website that basically all of our friends wrote for, and we had a pay what you can record label, which was an idea we had copied from quote unquote records, which was run by Jeff Rosenstock from bond, the music industry. That was sort of like the first digital pay what you can record label, like, you know, before Radiohead and everyone kind of adopted that. And then we had a TV show called Talk Show Night at Juicebox Manor, which was a talk show uh, that would have bands like play in our basement. And then we'd interview bands in our living room. And it was uh, truly, truly sick. And we put in some really like cool stuff and we had cool bands play at our house. Well, I found a (laughs) juicebox.com cover of the song. Yeah, man. Pathetic. I, uh, I, I the, fucking love this so much. I've never listened to this cover, but I remember liking this band. I've posted about them on Exclaim, I think, through you or something before, but they're called 
exclamation mark attention exclamation mark which i'm sure is exactly how they pronounce that's it that's how they you say and your it friends all pronounce it <laughs> yeah. to each other yeah totally <laughs> so yeah this is attention with it's from the compilation our favorite songs juicebox.com compilation 2010 hell yeah are you still doing this in 2010 yeah, this was like a Where late era has thing. Time gone. Yeah, and this was all. This was all. Uh, this entire compilation was put together by friend of the pod, Aaron Zorgel. This was like his project. Well, shit. Let's hear it, and then, <laughs> and then be honest about how bad it is. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I love those boys so much. I Yeah, that that was sick. I liked it too. It and to me like that's that those guys are kind of an example of like that to me is like okay, I'm grounded again. Like it's okay that this song means what it means. To me, I remember <laughs> seeing them play that. So like we're we're like junior battles and attention uh you know, best of friends used to share a practice space. Um Glenn is literally like filling in on has filled in in the past on drums for us and will be doing so in the near future. Um, I remember them doing that. There used to be a house in London, Ontario called the dude ranch. And, um, so it was named after come. <laughs> yeah. It was just like fucking come palace. And <laughs> we played there a bunch of times. We played there with attention and it was like, you know, you play till late and sleep at the house and just like drink all night. And I remember, Attention had played, we had played, some other bands played, and then, like, we kind of kept drinking, and it was, like, the Attention had a really good cover set, and so we eventually got them to go and do their cover set at, like, midnight or whatever, and I remember they started, or they finished with that, I don't know, I, like, it was a house show, and, and I had a couple of pops, and I just remember, like, that moment of, like, just imagine that in a, like, proper-ass basement, and you're jammed in with, like, 50 people, and, like, the band is your best friends, and you're there with all your best friends, and you're just like, this is it, man. Like, this is the sort of promise that I heard in this song when I was fucking 13, like, exists, and I have continued to, like, live that. And uh, I, I fucking that Jesus Christ. There's no other way for you're, me to express that memory. No, it's like, I mean, this is, it's like, uh, I don't know. It's like getting looking in the mirror naked is like you have to just do it. It's, <laughs> it's kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. Sometimes you have to. It's it's honest. You're right. I mean, you're totally right. It's uh, there's no way around it. It's fucking sick. It's so sick. And that's yeah. So that that cover is my final thought. That's it. It's just like <laughs> it reminds me of the 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 things that felt promising when I was younger, and a bunch of those things actually coming true. And it's just like the the things and the people that I fucking love are all like so wrapped up in that song. It's insane. <laughs> it's truly to think about it in that context is like actually really crazy to me. It's true. I mean, I don't really, it's kind of like I'm again, my whole life is the same thing, but from a different angle, like truly making smash mouth and smashing pumpkins have a fight about Shrek is literally <laughs> the promise of my childhood come to life. Yeah. So, it's wild, it's man. Cool. But like, I literally remember like, so attention, a lot of those guys used to be in an amazing band called horses that was much more like, uh, dirgy. Like they, they were doing, uh, there's no other way for me to sort of tee this up. They were doing like very sort of like Springsteen-y punk stuff, but before Gaslight Anthem blew up and everyone started doing that and I got really sick of it, but they were like really good and, and smart at that. And they had this amazing sort of singer songwriter, this guy Lockie. And so 
they were, but I didn't know them because they were all from North Sydney. And I, but I'd seen horses play a bunch of times and I was like, oh my God, this is like the best band in the city. I fucking love this band. And then a couple of the guys, the other guys that weren't the singer in horses put up like a video of them doing the, what ended up being the first attention demo with no vocals. And it was like that, all of their songs sounded like that. Like the drumming is all that out of control. Like it's just, it's, it's inspired by all those things. And I was like, this rules. And I cold emailed them because we had just started doing juice box at the time. And I was like, Hey, I really love horses. I saw that you guys are putting out a demo. We're doing this, like pay what you can label thing. I don't know what your plan is to do with it, but like, we'd be stoked to quote unquote, put it out. Like just cause you know, we, we had had a couple of things people had paid attention to. And so it was like, if it's of any benefit to you, it's a free way to put your record out. And, um, that was like literally the beginning of a very real friendship with, with those guys. And like that first, the first attention demo was like an early juice box records, juice box recording co release. And just to think that, all of those things like emerge from having the same experience when you're like 13 and hell yeah. Yeah. And then you grow up and you start a fight with Billy Corgan and, you know, (laughs) Steve smash. I mean, I think our entire generation is things that started on message boards are all real life now. (laughs) Yeah. That's it. Or like, (laughs) if you're lucky, man, if you're lucky, you know, all of the weird shit that you, you know, found in a, corner on the internet when you were like freaky and 13 is maybe real for you now and that's that's cool or you made the choice to like get a real job and then like not think about this stuff all day (laughs) right which is also healthy so (laughs) which is probably in the long run better yeah but i'm gonna i'm just gonna keep listening to pathetic all day today fuck dude same so was that your that I I sort of final thought it for about 15 minutes did you final thought in all that (laughs) i kind of i kind of (laughs) <laughs> oh god should in i a way of, in a way a final thought has also come <laughs> yeah, hell yeah um so on that note uh we have a guest this week as i mentioned earlier colleen green who we've featured uh on some past episodes for her uh for her blink covers i don't know what we're going to talk about because we haven't actually chatted yet so uh it could be really terrible so maybe here's a terrible conversation there's a good, there's a good chance that we're we're Working towards a three-hour episode again. Uh, so, this uh, is going to be, yeah. So uh, <laughs> if you just came here for Colleen Green, welcome to the third hour of this podcast. Um, but she is someone who, yeah, like I think her take on this band has always been like really exciting for us to uncover. And uh, here she is to uncover more Dude Ranch and Pathetic. So, Colleen, we've played on previous episodes of this podcast your covers of M&M's and Sometimes, and that's why I wanted to reach out to you, because it's clear that you are someone who loves this band, but for Josiah and I host this podcast, you're also someone who, like, we feel like you maybe like it for the same reasons we like it, and that as we're sort of getting into the depths of having to talk about California deluxe songs. You're like, are we crazy for loving this band? And then you like hear the stuff that you're doing and we're like, okay, no other people get this as well. So like, I guess I'm curious for you, you know, what was your introduction to this band? I know you said that like dude Ranch is kind of your album. One of the reasons that we wanted to do pathetic is because you said you particularly kind of love this song. So was this your gateway into Blink-182? Um, I don't really remember, actually. Um, I think that, like, I used to just, like, I am a really big, like, you know, old school MTV fan. And when I was in, like, middle school, um, that's like, you know, I just always watched MTV and, like, it actually was a, a decent tool for like finding out new music back in those days. Yeah. And, um, I think that, uh, damn it was a buzz clip maybe, or like I, I saw them on like 120 minutes or something like that. Um, and I just like, you know, I was just getting into like, like punk rock and like, you know, alternative shit at that point in time. 
So yeah, I think I, I definitely like damn it was the, the first song that I heard. And I think that their album had like just come out around the time, um, dude ranch that is. And, uh, yeah, I think I just like went and bought the CD and the rest is history. Hell yeah. And so like, what was it that made you like, have you tried to cover pathetic or is it sort of uncoverable? Like what's been, what's been your experience with the world of blink 182 covers? Um, I actually, uh, I don't like to like talk about this too much, but I'll, I'll do it for now. But, um, I had a plan to, to cover dude ranch in its entirety. Oh my God. Um, and I almost completed it about maybe, I think it was in 2013. Um, and I was, I covered the entire album only on bass. Um, and every song was very slow. So that's kind of how I like navigated it. Um, but, uh, I think I told too many people about it and like, when it was, when it was just almost to completion, my computer crashed No. and I, I, I hadn't backed up anything cause I'm a oh. fucking idiot and, um, I lost all of it. Like I had like, I had it all done, like besides maybe like five songs that I just needed to put vocals on. And, um, after then, like I've, I've, I've returned to it a couple times cause I really, really still oh. want to do it. Um, and I've, I've tried to like go back to it a couple times, but I just like, I think it just like broke my heart when that happened and I lost it all. Like, so every time I've tried to go back to it, I've just been like, so sad, you know, that I'm just like regretful and, you know, just like, oh man, I have to do this all again. Like I was so close, you know, so I haven't been able to, (laughs) I haven't been able to complete it in the last five years, but. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully someday. I mean, actually, this this podcast, like just you asking me to be on this podcast, is kind of like rekindling my interest in in doing that. So hopefully I'll be able to do that. Yeah. Can I just say, I mean, because <laughs> bo- like those those two covers that are out there of like older Blink shit truly have been like highlights of those episodes. And so I can at least cool. I feel like I can confidently speak on behalf of myself, Josiah, our listenership. That would be an extremely sick idea. Maybe we can maybe we could do like a Kickstarter or a GoFundMe or something just to like get you over the hump. But like, I had my eh. my head in my hands that entire time. I was like, <laughs> I can't believe how fucking close you were. Yeah, I know it sucks. Well, yeah. Let, so let us be the sort of like yeah wind beneath your wings, giving you the emotional <laughs> support to um, revisit that project. Although I can imagine that's like truly fucking heartbreaking. It was, yeah, it was really heartbreaking, and I feel like I hyped it up way too much, like, before it was done, and that's, like, I feel like doing that sometimes can kind of jinx certain things, so, yeah, I try not to talk about stuff that much these days, like, before it's actually done. Sometimes it's satisfying to talk about things, though. You have the emotional release of feeling like you've done it without having to do any of the work. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, like, that part's good. (laughs) <laughs> That's cool that you guys have been playing those covers, though. Where did you even find sometimes, like, was it a YouTube video that you, like, stole the audio from or something? Yeah, so it's definitely would have been YouTube. Um, the other the other guy who does the podcast does all of the research. I do, like, no, no work. I kind of just show up and talk about how much I love Dude Ranch. And oh, nice. And so he will, like, go deep and often find the most punishing possible cover of a song (laughs) and then he'll he'll like throw me a bone with like one thing that's actually good Um, Uh so I think it just came from him you know deep wormholing on YouTube yeah cool I've seen a few like pretty funny covers but actually they helped me when I was trying to make that covers album because on some of the um on some of the songs on Dude Ranch the the bass lines are really just weird and like you know there's like there's like a weird structure to them where I can't really figure out like what's going on. Um, and like, I, I did look up a few, uh, just people playing the like bass cover yeah. of, uh, waggy or whatever. And the, those, that, those actually did kind of help me a little bit. What, so I'm thankful for them. There you go. Much, much gratitude to the, the covers community on YouTube. Yeah. Do, do you feel like as, as a songwriter, I mean, one of the things that we talked about in particular with, with this song with pathetic is like, there's a little bit of a, an atypical way that, that some of the like 
it's deceptive, I guess, on uh, on this record, how songs sound really poppy. But, like, Pathetic has that weird, like, descending kind of chords through the chorus. Like, did that process give you uh, a, an appreciation for the band that maybe you hadn't had as a teenager who was just, like, into the record? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because especially because I was doing the covers, like, all on bass. So, I mean, I mean Tom, Tom DeLong shreds, obviously. Hell, yeah. But, like, yeah, the bass... Lines like, yeah, it's not just like, whoa. It's real motorcycle hours over oh. there. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, like, yeah, you just assume that every song is just like one, two, three, four, you know, um, one, one, four, five or whatever. But mm-hmm. yeah, he's like playing some crazy shit um, where I was just like, wow, I really never appreciated this before. And uh, and in my own songs over the years, I feel like the bass lines, because I'm not a bassist, obviously, but like the bass lines have been very one, two, three, four root note, you know, like nothing really that interesting going on. But I was just like, oh, damn, like th- these bass lines are pretty fucking awesome. And, and obviously, like, you know, I think Tom is sort of easy to focus on because he's got the aliens and the, you know, hammer on riffs mark. So I feel like sometimes like we're, he does not get the affection that, that he deserves. I, I did notice like in sort of trying to like maybe piece together, I was like, I wonder if Blink have like heard these covers and trying to do, you know, like uh, excavation, you know, t- Twitter work. It, has mm. Mark heard your covers? Because it's sort of like hard when you look at old tweets. It like looks like you guys have interacted, but uh-huh. it's, you can't like piece together the conversation. But, like, yeah. do, do you know, has he heard, has, does he have takes on your interpretations of their songs? Yeah, he um, posted uh, my cover of Eminem's on his Tumblr. That's so actually. sick. Um, I think, I, I think, okay, I have a, a friend named Wit Thomas uh, here in L.A., and he's a, a comedian. And he somehow, like, met Mark through the internet, I think through, like, a YouTube video of him doing an impression of Tom, like, um, I miss you era. Um, and I think Mark saw it or he contacted Mark or something like that. And Mark thought it was really funny. And Mark's just like a very funny person and has a great sense of humor. So I think he, uh, just like wanted to be friends, friends with, with wit. That's what um, I, I like and, the idea and, based on him doing an impression of Tom. Right. Right. Yeah. A really funny, like not flattering at all. Impression of Tom. <laughs> That's great. But, um, and also it's kind of funny because Wit and Mark look exactly alike. Um, and they, they went on to like form a cover band together that a couple of my other friends were in. And like, at this point I, I know Mark, like if I, like I, I have a picture of me and him together. That's like my prized possession. Congratulations. Like, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think that Wit showed him the cover of Eminem's or, it might have been Diarrhea Planet. It might have been through that band because they were on, they were guests on Mark's podcast at one point. Or it might have been uh, this band Pause that's from Scotland that I'm friends with. They actually had a record that was produced by Mark, and they might have actually showed it to him. I don't remember, it, but there's a lot of avenues that it could have uh, come from. But all I know really is that Mark has heard my cover he likes it, um, and now I like know Mark, and I get to like tell people that. <laughs> That's so. and it's immortalized. It's on a podcast. I can now. die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it such a trip? Like I, I feel like this is, you know, a consistent part of it. if you grow up, you know, a music fan, and then you end up being a musician, or you end up being a music journalist, or somehow kind of involved in culture that. You can you can say like holy shit like I've got a photo with Mark we're kind of friends this is someone who I saw damn it on MTV and it sort of like fucked my brain up like <laughs> is it, that's such yeah. a trip it is really trippy I I definitely think about it a lot and I'm I I'm very grateful like to be able to say that in in my life and um, yeah like I mean. He doesn't even, they don't even know how influential they were on not only my, like, my music that I ended up making, but, like, I feel like my music is just, like, a small part of, like, I I feel like when people listen to my music, they probably don't hear Blink-182, but, like, they, 
they influenced me to even want to pick up a guitar in the first place. And, um, just like my whole style, my whole personality, like at that, at that age, it was a very formative age. I feel like I was like 12 or something when I first like discovered them and it, it definitely shaped my entire personality. It, it influenced like who my friends were and, you know, like what I, what kind of activities I did in my life, like what kind of, what my sense of humor ended up turning out to be, you know, like just every aspect of my life was very heavily influenced by them. And now I, like, like I, you know, I, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to like sit down with Mark and like tell him that, nor would I really want, like, you know, I might put that in a nutshell, but yeah, I'm just like really, really thankful that somehow I ended up in LA and got to meet these people that ended up leading to me meeting not only Mark, but Scott Rayner as well, which I still like am pretty tripped out by. That's so rad. It's, it's funny. Like this, this podcast has been like equal parts, very sincere. Like I am, uh, I've had the exact same experience as you in terms of the, the importance of the band. Obviously we're doing a, a mm-hmm. fucking three year <laughs> podcast project about it, but we're also like cool detached irony bros. We're like, we can, uh, you know, a lot of it is like making fun of uh, the, the foibles of a, some of the songs or whatever. But this episode <laughs> has been like so achingly sincere because of like <laughs> the, 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 the place that pathetic kind of holds in, in, I, I think like all of our hearts and that this record, like that this is just like such a gateway to exactly what you described. Yeah. Um, so wait, tell me about the Scott Rayner thing. Cause I did want to ask about your Scott Rayner shirt. Like you have a, I don't know. I don't know if that Scott Rayner sells Scott Rayner shirts or you made a Scott <laughs> Rayner shirt, but one of your press photos is you in like a shirt that just says Scott Rayner. Uh, yeah. Uh, I made it myself. Um, I you should sell that as like Colin green merch. What? You should sell that as like your own merch. Uh, no, I don't think Scott would like that. Actually, it's probably um, insanely weird. Yeah. What you're kind of cutting out? What'd you say? No, it just I I imagine that would be insanely weird for him. Yeah, he had mixed feelings about my my personal Scott Rayner shirt, but I think I just uh, I don't know. I'm just I I love Scott. I love like his drumming style. And I, I really think that he's like the best pop punk drummer ever. And especially on, um, on dude ranch, I think his drumming is like excellent and just like really heavy and, and cool. And there's rumors that he had two broken heels, I think when he recorded that album. And I, I feel like I maybe asked him about it at one point, but I don't remember what the answer was, but I like to believe that he had two broken heels and still like kicked major ass on that, that album. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I was, I was slated to like perform at this show that was going to be taped for, uh, Carson Daly, whatever his show is, his like late night show. Yeah. It's like super, super damn late with Carson Daly or something. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Latest show possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I just was like, well, this is my first time being on national TV. So like, I might as well make a shirt that says Scott Rayner on it and like wear that. So, and, and, um, so this guy named, uh, Cundy, um, was at the show because he is friends with King Tuff, who also played the show and Cundy, um, was in a band with Scott Rayner and he came up to me after my set and was like, oh, my God, you have a Scott Rayner shirt? Like, what the fuck? Like, I'm friends with Scott. Can I take a picture of that to send to him? Because I think he would, like, be really tickled by it or whatever. So he took a picture of me with the Scott Rayner shirt, sent it to Scott Rayner. Apparently, Scott was, like, really into it. Um, and he emailed me, like, at least a year later, maybe maybe more than a year later, Um saying uh, that he was interested in starting a band with Jack White and wondering if I knew Jack White and if if so, could I put in a, a good word or like pass the word along for him? And it turns out I actually, I, I don't personally know Jack White, but I do have friends that do know Jack White. You are one degree from everyone, eh? <laughs> I, get, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, uh, 
not everybody, but certain like weird ones. Yeah. Um, but so I was like, uh, actually, yeah, I, I kind of do like have a link to Jack White and I did pass the word along. I don't know if it ever got to Jack White, but then like, you know, I was like, uh, is this really like the real Scott Rayner? Cause like, what the fuck? And he sent me a picture of his like passport. <laughs> he, he was like, no, no, it's really me. It's really me. And it turns out that he just wanted to like, you know, open up some dialogue about like my shirt and my music. Um, cause he's a fan. And he also wanted to tell me that, um, I shouldn't drink or smoke weed as much as I do. And I should stop asking strangers for rides on Twitter. <laughs> so Scott Rainer's just like real dad hours, eh? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. He's, yeah, he's cool. I've, so I've met him a couple times. I invited him to a couple of shows and, um, um, we, we talked a little bit about like playing music together. I still think that that would be a dream, but, um, yeah, I don't know. That's so it, sick. We're, we it, are like constantly hounding his, um, not constantly. I think we've sent two messages on Facebook to the like <laughs> death core band that he's in just being oh. like Scott. Cause we like Scott is Scott also got out at the right time. So Scott's legacy in blink is, you know, pristine. It's, it's pristine, right? It's fucking perfect. Yeah. And yeah. so like, you know, if put in a good word, like Scott asking you to put in a good word with Jack White, please put in a good word for us with Scott. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I mean, I'll send him this podcast. I'll email him. I haven't talked to him in a while. Um, I won't we hold you to about, that. Like, <laughs> but what? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, wait, so are you guys still talking about maybe, like, playing music together, though? I would love to do that, because I just think he's the best drummer, like, in the world. Um, Absolutely. I don't know. Um, I I, like, already kind of, like... I'm really shy about playing music with other people, um, obviously. Um, but, um, I, I don't know. He might be like too much of an idol for me to actually play music with, but we'll see. I mean, this guy wit that I mentioned er earlier, we've, we've really been wanting to like start a pop punk band for a, a while. And I feel like, again, it's like that shit that I just like talk about and then it never reaches fruition, but it is something that I would really like to do. I just feel like everybody's really busy, but you know, and we don't have a practice space, so it's like a logistical thing. But um, if that ever gets off the ground, I would love to reach back out to Scott and see if he would be down. We it kind of was like supposed to start as a screeching weasel cover band, and Scott told me that he doesn't like screeching weasel, so so that's <laughs> I don't a know. bit of a wrench, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. We'll see. Well, I, I will continue to hold out hope for sure. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, you mentioned the impact that they had on you, like holistically, but something that I, I, I promised that I would ask uh, a friend of the pod, uh, Daniel Halliburton, who designed some stuff for us, uh, he <clears throat> had a theory after we played. So he's, he's a big fan. And after we played the Sometimes cover, which he had actually never heard, he was like, you have to ask her – if the sometimes cover influenced how deeper than love came to be. Cause he feels like deeper than love <laughs> is like spiritually connected to your sometimes cover. And I promised I would ask that. Wow. Um, <laughs> that could be a succinct know. to know it's, and I'll just tell him it's fine. Yeah, no, I, it's possible. I never put those two together before, but I think I just am like a wannabe bass player basically. Just a struggling bass, bass player, bass player trapped yeah, in not a bass um, player's body. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even really feel like I'm a guitar player. Like I just kind of like I I can make it make some kind of noise, but like I would never call myself a guitarist. Um, I think I yeah I, I think I I really just like the bass as an instrument, and I like wish that I was a bass player because I really you know I wish I could like really kick it and get funky with it and stuff like that. But, um, the best I can really do is just playing like boom, 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 boom. So yeah, I think, um, it's just like that, like me wanting to just be a bass player, but sucking at it and 
you know, that's just that's just the best I can do. I like to imagine how dramatically different your output would be if you like truly slapped the bass, like if you were <laughs> like Dave Matthews kind of like so, but still the same approach to songwriting, but then just with like vividly funky bass lines. <laughs> that would be fucking awesome. I think uh, I think I would probably make a lot of money. Does it, <laughs> it, Dave Matthews a bass player? No, I meant like you in the Dave Matthews band. I believe. Oh, oh. <laughs> he's he's yeah. simply a funky acoustic guitar player. Unless I, I've never yeah. seen them live. Maybe he like does a bass solo. It seems entirely possible. Well, the bass player in that band was pretty good, actually. But I, they're all yeah. very talented. It's a talented band. <laughs> For sure, Dave Matthews is kind of a funny character because he like ended up popping up in a few Adam Sandler movies which is my other area of expertise, is Adam Sandler. It's Blink-182 and Adam Sandler, basically. <laughs> Those are, like, your two passions? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Did, did that make you, like, reevaluate how you felt about Dave Matthews? Um, uh, I mean, I never really, like, cared that much about Dave Matthews one way or the other. Um, but then, yeah, he popped up in, in Blended and, or, um, Just Go With It. Mm -hmm. And, uh... Yeah, I think it is blended, actually. It's like the two... Oh, the Drew Barrymore know, ones? Yeah. Okay, blended is Drew Barrymore, and they go to Africa. So maybe that was because he's, like, from Africa, but... I don't know. He's he's in a couple of Adam Sandler movies, and he always plays, like, a like latently like homosexual type of character, which is kind of weird, and I don't really, like... I don't know. I'm not, like, really down... With his lot, characters that he's played, but... A lot of gay panic in those movies, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's not... I don't co-sign on that, just yeah. saying, but I, I do love Adam Sandler. You can love most of the output and not agree with everything. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think about that way with Blink-182, actually, too. Like, I think about that a lot, actually. Like, like they they really did... They They, like... It was such a moment in time for them, because if they said half the shit that they said back then today, like it would not fly. There's no way. Oh yeah. We, we've talked. Like, yeah. Imagine, you know, I need a girl that I can train or, oh. or the party song. Like there's like, there's some kind of fucked up stuff lurking back there. Yeah. But they just got away with it. Like they just like, you know, skated right in, like just under the, under the, I don't know what I'm, my brain is like fried right now, but <laughs> under the, like what, whatever it, point it would have like not been okay. They were kind of like, you're like, ah, they're just boys being boys. And now you're like, right. That's a fucked up thing to say actually. Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> but uh -huh. that was like their whole shtick. Like when we, when I would go to see them, I remember like the first time I went to see them and I was telling my, fr I'm from Massachusetts, but I had a friend that was originally from California and he had seen them a couple times like before that. And I was really excited about going to see them for the first time. And I was like talking about it with him. And he was like, he was like, Oh, like you don't even know like what they're like, man, like from their, you know, from their songs and stuff. Like when you see them live, you're going to, you're going to see like what they're really like. And I was like, huh? And then I saw them and I was like, Oh my God. Like these guys are fucking crazy. They've got, They've got dirty mouths. <laughs> they are crass boys for sure. Yeah. It's funny. We, we have, we have pondered this before and I'm curious sort of with your sort of closeness to Mark, like how, cause he's obviously has grown into a progressively minded individual. Like he's on the right side of, you know, the contemporary culture wars, I guess. And yeah. how he feels about some of that, because like there's, there's not a lot of like, I mean, there's not any, like, really regrettable language, maybe, but some of the ideas are, like, again, it's, like, the party song is one that we did recently where we were, like, the song is fucking bad. Like, it's really kind of <laughs> toxic and weird, and I wonder how he feels about it. Like, they still play Dumpweed Live. Like, does that, do you even think about it? Maybe you don't, because you're just, like, I'm just doing my job now, and I wrote these songs 20 years ago. Like, it's, it's an impossible yeah. question, maybe. Like, what do you think he thinks? But I guess I'm asking that for some dumb reason. Well, Dumpweed is an amazing song. Like Hell yeah. They that's one of their like best songs, I think. 
Um, and I, I don't think that line is like too bad. Like, I think you're, you're still allowed to like say what you want. Um, you know, within, within reason. I mean, you're, you're allowed to say what you want no matter what. And it's, you know, like it doesn't like, we don't have to like, we, we can be offended by it, you know, and like, we can like say that's, that's fucked up. That's really fucked up and you're fucked up for saying it, but people can still say it, you know, like he can say, I need a girl that I can train. Actually. Like I, I really like that lyric actually. Um, and yeah, I guess it's problematic, but I think that if they want to say it, like they can say it, you know, whatever. I think that's the right attitude towards it for sure. <laughs> yeah. What is it about that lyric that you like? Um, I don't know. I think it's just cool. <laughs> yeah, it's and I, I think it's like, very evocative and weird and aggressive for sure. Yeah, I mean, I definitely had a huge crush on Tom when I was like young in school, and I, I just think I was like, "You can train me, man." <laughs> <laughs> You're like, "I'm here, I'm ready. It's all good. Come out yeah. to Massachusetts sometime." <laughs> And then, so I do want to ask about Pathetic, because that's obviously sort of the song that this particular episode is is centered around. And, like, so we talked a little bit about Damn It and sort of finding Dude Ranch, but uh, is there anything in particular in this song that, you know, as something that you obviously got into as a younger person and now sort of having more distance from that, but obviously still sort of being a fan of the band, like, what is it about Pathetic that kind of makes it stand out for you on this album? Um... I think it's a really great uh, album open, opener, um, and I think it's become my favorite song like over the years, and especially after I started doing that covers project. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's just a really, really good int- introduction um, to the album and like the themes of the album, like just being like a loser and like you know, like loser kids, you know, loserkids.com or whatever. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, and yeah, I just think it's like really heavy and I love, I think it's like a quintessential Blink-182. Like if, if somebody from the future, like came back in time and, and was like, Oh, Blink-182, what is that? Like, I would show them pathetic, I think, because you have the, the Mark and Tom, um, you know, call and response vocals, which I think are really cool. I love that they both sing on the song. Um, and like, you have the awesome Scott Rayner drumming. You have the cool, like Tom lead lines. And it's just like a really catchy song. I love the lyrics. It, it just, it's a great, it's a great song. Yeah. Basically everything about it is perfect. I completely yeah. agree. <laughs> well, well put. Yeah. Yeah. It's also like truly like, <laughs> re, like Scott runs this song. Like I, I, you talk about sort of him being like one of the, like one of the greatest drummers, like truly the, like one of the great punk drummers. Like this song yeah. is like a, a highlight, I think for, for what he is capable of. Yeah. For sure, and it's a really good introduction to um, to uh, Voyeur too. Hell yeah! Like, it, like I don't know. My friend once said something that I will never forget. He said, um, "I always thought it was the first song on an album, but it's actually the second song." Which you know, I I could go back and forth with that actual sentiment, but I think that it's like, especially in this case. Pathetic is not only an amazing opener song, but it's also a really good, like, introduction to the rest of the songs on the album. Yeah, it sets the table really effectively. Yeah. Uh, So, Colleen, uh, uh, do you have anything that is happening right now that this is sort of the, like, podcast promo spot, hot new shit, hot new tour dates, just, like, general things you're excited (laughs) about that you would like to plug? Uh, <clears throat> TV um, series you're watching, that kind of thing. Oh, well, today's Wednesday, so I'm excited because that means that there's a new episode of Castle Rock um, coming on I haven't been today. watching that. Is it good? Um, well, I'm a really big Stephen King fan, so I'll watch 
you know, I'll read any Stephen King book. I'll watch anything that has to do with Stephen King. And he didn't write it, but it, it's based on, like, his universe. Yeah, it's all, and, like, little Easter eggs and shit, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, he's, like, a consultant, or he might be a um, producer um, on the show. But I just think it's a really cool idea. And um, I love Stephen King. I'm from New England. I love Maine. Um, it's definitely a creepy place. Like, I think it's, I think it's really cool. And so I would tell people to watch that. Um, I have a double EP coming out on September 7th. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not really playing too many shows right now, but I'm trying to work on writing a new album. So hopefully I can get that recorded sometime soon. And, um, that's about it. And perhaps this experience will have like pressured you to revisit the dude ranch idea. Truly. Yeah. I, I mean, there's no excuse. And that's kind of like my problem too, is that I've been hating on myself for like not doing it over the past five years, but I feel like I really could just do it in like one day. Like the last time I did it, it was two weeks. I gave myself two weeks to do it. And I really almost achieved that goal until my stupid ass computer died and my stupid ass didn't back anything up. Um, so that's kind of like lesson learned. And I, I did get an external hard drive after that experience. Um, so yeah, hopefully I can just kick that out maybe today. Who knows? Oh, please do. (laughs) We'll see.